Uh, hold on one second. Hello, everyone. Hi, Deb, Miss Pat, Frank A, and Philip. We already <laughs> said hello. Um, okay, let me just. Hello, everyone. Hello, Deb. Hello, um, I am waiting for the agenda. To play. Okay. Um, so I am calling the meeting to order. It is 602 pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. See instructions below. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, so the meeting is called to order. Um, everybody's present. Do I have to do the thing where I go around and say everybody's name and then they say things? And... Just to make sure we're all heard. Yeah. Make sure everybody can hear. Okay, um, I'm gonna just go by the order on my screen. Philip, can you hear us and can we hear you? Yep. Perfect. Here. Thank you. Uh, D. Here. Perfect. Pamela. Here. Wonderful. Uh, Freke. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Pat. No. Okay. Ms. Pat, I think you're muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. There you are. Perfect. Um, and Deborah. Here, and I can hear you. Perfect. Um, I always feel like a school teacher when I'm doing that. It's very, it doesn't feel, it feels funny to me. Um, so let's see, I'm just gonna review the agenda really quickly. Um, first, we'll have public comment, then a presentation on the resident oversight board, then, uh, a presentation on the Massachusetts Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission, then statements from the families and youths of Amherst 9, um, Victim Compensation Fund, Justice Compensation Fund, DEI, which is Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and CRESS, which is Community Responders for Equity, Safety, and Service Updates. Any topics not anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance of the meeting, and then that it. Um, so first is public comment. Um, during the public comment period, the chair will recognize members of the public when called on. Please identify yourself by stating your full name, preferred pronouns, and residential address. Um, residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the chairs based on the number of people who wish to speak. No speaker can cede their time to another. The CSSJC will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. Um, and I just wanted to check in with the group because I know last time we did public comment at the end as well. I don't know if that's something we want to do. I, I personally kind of like it because people might have something to react, respond to from the meeting. So I don't know if people are open to having two public comment periods. I like it. Um, you know, sometimes it's uh, people join later or they are there for a particular spot on the agenda that they want to hear. So I think it's an important, but it's up to the committee. Uh, Ms. Pat? I agree. Um, I've attended a couple committee meetings and they've been very flexible in terms of uh, public comments. All right. um, does anybody have any opposition to having a second public comment period? Could we vote on it? Sorry? Could we vote on it? Here. So we have to make a motion. Okay. So did you want to make a motion, um, Fricke? To make a motion for um, public comments, both at the beginning and the end of BC uh, SSJC meetings. Does someone second it? 
I second. Can I second? Am I allowed to second? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I second. Okay. All in favor of uh, Bricke's motion. Okay. No abstentions and no nays. So it, it passes overwhelmingly. Okay. So that being said, we will go to our first public comment period. Um, there are two members of the public. If either of you would like to speak, please raise your hand and um, we'll figure out how to make that happen. Seeing no hands raised at this time, we can move on then to the next agenda item, which is the Resident Oversight Board timeline. So that would be Pamela. I think you're muted, Pamela. Ms. Pat, is your hand up or was that up from earlier? No, it's up. Okay. Just very right. quickly, do, uh, Ms. Uh, Young, do you know if uh, the two liaisons were sent this meeting notice, the town councilors? Oh, I do not know that. The, uh, um, uh, the notice was sent out by Angela, as you know, Jen is out and I'm yeah. not, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure whether it was sent to them. Okay, um, I'll just, I I'll message them right now. Mm -hmm. I know Pat DeAngelis had emailed me right after okay. our last meeting and said she was unable to attend tonight, but I have not heard from Dorothy Pam. Okay, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to message her. Yeah, I know that um, Pat DeAngelis is, is away. Okay. So, um, all right, I'm going to attempt to share screen at this point. So in, included in your packet was um, a draft of a proposed timeline for the creation of a resident oversight board. And I'm not gonna go through the five page uh, document in detail, but just basically want to talk about what the, propo uh, the proposed timeline would look like. So it's a five step process that looks, uh, includes community engagement, selection of the board model, developing board policies and procedures, selection um, and training of board members and implementation of the board. Um, based on the work that the CS, CSW group did, the acronyms sometimes are difficult for me to remember, um, and looking at their work, I think we have a pretty aggressive timeline of trying to get this accomplished within a 10 month period. Uh, that would mean that the board would be in place by the beginning of the new fiscal year um, in July. Uh, I think that uh, that's still doable, but it is a pretty aggressive timeline considering that we're already a, a, a bit delayed in having discussions about this and have not started the community engagement um, process. Um, so some of the challenges would be the fact that there is a slight delay in the start. Um, I, I think engaging the community in various aspects of having discussions about the creation of the board, what it would look like. And I know that a lot of work has been done previously um, on the, all of these topics, but it's my understanding that there wasn't wide engagement of the entire community. And so that as part of the um, working groups, I think it's report B is one of the things that is desirable in order for the creation of the board. And then the other, I think challenge is the collective bargaining agreement of the, um, of the police department as it currently stands. I believe the supervisor's uh, collective bargaining agreement is um, being negotiated now and very shortly the uh, patrolman's agreement will be negotiated. Um, 
one of the opportunities, and you'll hear more from Dr. Shabazz about that, is uh, that's um, is post because while there has not been, I think, discussion about the creation of a resident oversight board during the current uh, collective collective bargaining agreement negotiations. The state legislation from post would mandate some of the things uh, that you would desire. And so there's, I think there's a way in which um, you might not maybe you you may be able to create a board that it doesn't exactly mirror the board that was designed and included in the CSWG working report, but one that would allow you to achieve some of the um, desired outcomes by relying on the post uh, legislation, so. Yep. Are we able so, to, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was gonna ask. So uh, um, Pamela, are you done? Do you want questions at this point? Oh, sure, I sure. I mean, I, I, this I know was on the, uh, I, I, I don't, it, I don't see that there was a lot of point in going through page by page. And I know that the document was shared with you in, um, in August. So I'm hoping that people have had an opportunity to take a look at it and, and ask more specific questions. And um, as you know, it's still very much in the draft form. So I, I guess I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one would be, uh, I know you talked about you know, engagement and stuff like that. So uh, when, who would be the, the the people to really kind of decide who's gonna be selected on the board? Um, you know, do you have a process for that or is that something that you're gonna like, you know, work out, um, you know, as, as the timeline goes or do you have any so, idea right now? So, so I think that the, the plan would be to follow the suggestions of the working group as far as board selection is concerned, but that would be ultimately would be a decision that the town council would have to make um, because it, it would be a part of their decision and the, I guess, bylaws or ordinance that they would cre create in order to establish the board. Yeah. So yeah, because I guess, yeah, because I guess my thing would be like, you know, like you said, CSWG, we definitely, you know, kind of did a, a very kind of detailed outline in terms of some of the things that we wanted to, to, to see. And I know you said you're going to be getting a lot of kind of stakeholder feedback, but, you know, hopefully, again, to just remind to, to make sure that you are getting the feedback from our group, CSSJC, throughout the process, because, um, you know, we're going to be really looking at this Hawkeye. Uh, in terms of, you know, what, how, you know, people are going to be selected, you know, making sure that there's a stipend connected to this. This was a big part of our discussion. So resources mm -hmm. funding so that they could be um, people of color and people who are marginalized, people from all backgrounds on this um, board, because we know that a lot of times, you know, folks that are marginalized aren't able to be part of it because, you know, they don't have to, they have to work, they have this, they have that. So if there's a stipend or something connected to it, something that's a little bit more tangible, then that will make it more feasible. So obviously that's going to be something else that we're going to look at. Um, and then, and then third, the other one is what's going to happen in the meantime. I understand that obviously it takes time for a board of, of this type to be put in place. Um, but what's going to happen in the meantime, right? So we've got 10 months. Mm -hmm. So who uh, is the community going to rely on to deal with, you know, like, especially like, you know, what happened with Amherstein and, you know, hopefully it won't happen again, but we can't just rely on hope, right? So what are we going to do in the meantime? Who's going to be the kind of, you know, group or panel or, or whatever that folks can rely on mm -hmm. if they have complaints against the police? Because mm -hmm. they're not going to go to the police. Right. They're going to have to. So I, I think that's a complex question because we are bound by the current structures that are in place. And um, currently there is not anything in, in place that would even come close to being what was desired of this resident oversight board. Um, and so I, I'm not really certain that there is a, a, a concrete answer to that question. I mean, what we have, what Philip has tried to use uh, or the Human Rights Commission is to use their position as a way to 
um, ask questions of the police department. Certainly the DEI director's position can ask questions of the police department, but neither the Human Rights Commission nor the, my role as the DEI director would have the authority to have you know, full oversight, investigation, um, discipline. You know, those, those things are not in place at this point. Yeah, and I guess that's what I'm saying. I'm, I guess right. what I'm saying is that it, it needs to be in place. The stop right. gap needs to so, be in uh, place. Yeah. So, so in the I, meantime, because if not, yeah. we're 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 going to be you know in the same situation for the next ten months until July 2023, right. which right. again is not going to be feasible for for community members for us to just say, well, you know, just keep using what's in place for the next you know ten months until so, July. I, um, yeah, so I don't, I don't have a good um, solution for a stopgap measure. I think if you wanted to fast track a resident um, advisory board, you would have to decide that the some of the things that are that the board would be able to do, some of the power of the board. Um, would have to change. So I and then, I mean, of course I'm saying all of this is just thinking about the process. But let's let's say for instance that you wanted to fast track a resident oversight board, and um, and one thing that the might occur would be to change the position of the board so that it was advisory as opposed to investigatory, or um, didn't have the uh, you know we were willing to not include the power to discipline police officers. So some of those things that would be required uh, to be a part of the collective bargaining agreement, which might cause a delay in the process if they were if there were if they were foregone, then that might speed up the process. I am not certain of um, of what sort of an intermediary type or agency or board might look like. Um, in the research that I, that I did and in the research that you all did that's referred to in the reports um, from the CSWG group, I don't recall any type of board that was sort of like a placeholder or, or something that was in between the two processes that currently existed in the city. Of course, I, you know, this is not my area of expertise, so I might have overlooked something and obviously would be willing to do more research or listen to other ideas, but I, I don't, I'm not aware of a, of a placeholder, for lack of a better term, agency. Well, yeah, and so, so let me, let me say it this way. Um, you know, one, um, we don't want to, to, you know, if it's going to, it's going to take time to put the board in place and we don't want to take away, you know, the strength and the power of the board that mm -hmm. needs to be in place. And obviously I know you, you need to work with the unions and, and obviously that's, that's something that's going to take some time and everything. So that need, needs to happen. Like in terms of CSWG, remember we were getting pushed too, right? We were getting pushed to do things very quickly, very fast. So we can think of everything. Mm -hmm. However, you know, one of the realities, right, is that to put this board in place is going to take time. So then what has become apparent is that there needs to be a stopgap. You know what I'm saying? So that's what all I'm saying. I'm saying that there mm -hmm. does need to be a stopgap. It's not that we thought of everything because we couldn't think of everything at that time because we were under the gun to get these things done, right? Um, but the stopgap is going to be important. It's going to be necessary. So I, I guess I'm, I'm asking you and you know, and others within the, the town, you know, I don't know what other folks in, in leadership there, you know, maybe with Phil from the Human Rights Commission, I don't know, to kind of put y'all's y'all head together, maybe come and talk to us, maybe we can put our head together too, for us to come up with a stopgap. That's what I'm saying. And I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you, Deb. I, you bring up so many um, good points and some of the ones that, um, you know, I was thinking of. And while you were speaking, just trying to think through that, what would uh, potentially, um, you know, uh, be a stopgap. So first off, 
the engagement with the community, it's important that the CSSJC know um, with whom and how, mm -hmm. because uh, part of the uh, issue, you know, in terms of equity and diversity is that, again, we're at the table and we're helping to advise. Um, I do like that you have input from POCU and, and the BSU, but, you know, just in thinking through that, as far as higher ed, um, the Latino students, you know, they have their own kind of student body organization. Um, also the academic one, uh, CLACUS, and then um, BSU, but Afro-American studies. And there's several different student black um, African descendant people's groups on campus, including Caribbean student organization. Um, you know, so I'm just saying it's much more complex in terms of uh, looking to uh, students of color. I think we do have to, to cast the net wide with that and so, utilize yeah. real quickly and utilize the, the resources that we have and we could help with that. So that's that. And, and then you can respond one moment. And mm -hmm. then in terms of advisory as a stopgap, maybe a, some type of configuration of the HRC, the CSSJC uh, and DEI at least on an advisory basis as a stopgap, the same configuration that we are basically uh, committing to right now. Because as it stands, and once I get to post how the complaints are being lodged, there is um, a lack of, there's a lack of safety for uh, people to lodge complaints. They're asking for birth dates, well, you know, those types of things, names, you know, the whole thing to lodge a complaint with the police. This has been the problem that we've had previously. And I'll stop there. Yes. Yeah. So I just want to um, to say that I, I really think that the entire committee would have to be involved in community engagement. And I, I um, would hold up the model that the African Heritage Reparation uh, Assembly is doing, which includes um, really an expectation that everyone on in the assembly, so everyone in this group would participate. One of the things that I um, that I have had some discussions with uh, Brianna, the communications director, about is that um, I think that we there needs to be a script developed so that we are all, you know. Um, really speaking and in, in with one voice about the, the issue. So not people aren't going to one event and hearing one thing and then another event and hearing an, um, something else differently. But, you know, the DEI department is, is only a department of two. And in order to do the widespread uh, engagement that is necessary, um, we're going to need help. And it would be my expectation that it would be the members of this group who would be um, participating in that community engagement. And I think that was part, part of your charge. So it's not, I don't envision that, that we're going, we meaning the DEI department are gonna do this work alone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Pat? Nope, nope, you're, you're muted, unmute. Goodness, sorry about that. So Ms. Young, um, Thank you for putting this together and for the presentation. So, um, but um, Deb and Allegra have said some of the points I wanted to make, um, but to have community feedback engagement, I have to push back on that because when CSWG when we were meeting, um, we, through consultant, they did engage some folks. We also had like consultant out of town that also did some, that gave us some feedback. It's very, you know, with issue of police, police is triggering for some people. So I'm wondering, is it really a good use of anybody's time 
to spend the month of October doing community feedback. It's, it's just a you know, question that I put, you know, I'm posing. Mm -hmm. I would rather have it focus on, so the projected date is June, 2023. What I would like to see is, you know, will that be by law ready for the new resident oversight board? So you know, will it be up and running, meaning forming the board and everything by the June deadline? I think we need to think really deeper, prioritizing, you know, what needs to be done. And regarding the uh, gap, right now we don't have ROOB. And I happen to attend um, the Human Rights Commission last week, Wednesday, I urge everyone and people who are listening in and people who will listen in in the future to check out that particular meeting. Um, it saddens me that the town created this commission with highly talented, smart members, and yet the bylaw for HR, HRC makes it impossible for this commission to do their job. It's something we need to think about. If we're talking about having a um, human rights commission to be the gap body, we need to have the bylaw that is current amended so that they will have the power to make decision. I was really frustrated as I was listening to the meeting. And um, I think we need to make change. If we're talking about dismantling racism, we need to roll up our sleeves and do the work. Thank you. So I, I, I will invite uh, Philip to comment about the bylaw and just focus on the first uh, issue that you raised, which is around uh, community engagement. All of the research that I've done, the research that was cited in the working group document, all uh, point to the fact that in order for a board to be very successful, there has to be community buy a buy-in. And um, obviously I wasn't here during the work that the group did previously, but it is my understanding, and you can correct me if, I am in, if I'm wrong, that there was not widespread discussion about the resident oversight board. Um, and um, as I said, the research seems to indicate that that is a necessary component. Um, uh, so I, you know, I, I don't think that's a, a has occurred. I think it is important. I don't think it's a waste of time. I think it is possible to engage in community engagement and work on the bylaw at the same time. Philip, do you have anything to share? Yeah, I was just going to share that. I think that the resident oversight board is a very necessary part that I believe um, previous CSWG members saw coming in. Thank you for that foresight because it, as Ms. Pat has kind of into that, right now with the Human Rights Commission, we're kind of at a standstill because of a bylaw that won't allow us to push the envelope further than we would like it to go right now. We have put in, and we'll hear later today, um, the voices of the families and the voices of the children um, involved in this incident. And other than putting it on record, it does not seem that it's going to be pushed in any direction. And so we're looking at different avenues as to where we can go, whether that be with post, um, and looking to see if town council might be open to changing bylaws. We're having a retreat um, this next week, I believe, on the second. So once I know that's a discussion point for us. So we got a lot of work cut out there for the Human Rights Commission is all I'm trying to say. And right now, this 
purview of not having an over or the resident oversight board is very evident and very needed in our community. And I kind of like the idea of having CSSJC, HRC, and um, the DEI department maybe be that gap that Deb was talking about for the time being till we create the oversight board. Thank you. Thank you. Allegra, you have your hand up. I think you had your hand up first. Well, they've already heard from me. I'll come back. Why don't you go ahead? Um, I, I, at first when I saw this, I was kind of thinking, oh my gosh, this is such a long time frame. But I do appreciate that it seems that the steps involved are with deliberation. So it's it does leave us in this place where we don't have something in place for longer than we would like to not have something in place for. But I, I do think that the idea of getting community feedback, especially if CSSJC is involved in those engagement efforts so, so that we're involved in hearing from the community is important. And I think, I think the one on the one hand, it could show whether there's buy-in and on the other hand, there might be something that we didn't think of that a community member does have um, to bring to the table. I do think that it should be a both and, so we're not just not working on the bylaw until we've checked the engagement box. We're thinking about two things at once. Um, and I guess my question would be if there is any more kind of specific idea about who might sit on a on on an interview committee for this would it be a, you know would there be representation from our committee from HRC from DEI from town cap like because I know for example when this committee was formed there were various stakeholders that were brought in that weren't necessarily related to any of the town committees in town but had a lot of knowledge and care for the work that was being done. So, so I guess I'm just wondering how the selection of the selectors would work. Okay, so I, so let me just repeat your question to make sure I understand it. So you're asking who would participate in the selection of the individuals who would be on the resident oversight board? Yes. Okay, all right. So um, it is, my understanding that the town um, would um, be following the recommendation of the previous uh, working group. So I, um, I am not familiar enough with all of the procedures uh, in the town to stay, to understand whether that is discussions with the personnel board and the town manager about the composition. I, 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 quite frankly, I just don't know the details of, the, of that answer, but it is my understanding that the recommendations of the working group are what would be guiding that process. And those recommendations, as you, as you know, called for a majority BIPOC a board with representation from other marginalized groups in, in town. Thank you. Thank you. I'm I'm assuming, and I, I could be totally off base, but that the um the town manager um as kind of the, the head CEO, head CFO, so to speak, of, of the town of Amherst um, appoints that committee to uh, as a hiring committee, so to speak. Um, and then they select folks. And uh, again, hopefully uh, it's gonna be across the board in terms of BIPOC representation. Um, I just wanted to um, say in terms of the timeline, I want to agree with Deb that a lot of, you know, once again, a lot of this research has been done, but one of the critical components that CSWG had in terms of getting this work completed was not only, of course, their commitment to it, but hiring 
qualified consultants, and I'm not even talking about me, I'm talking about the one from out of town, you know, uh, that did the final report with, with CSWG, um, hired consultants to help with this work, um, review uh, boards in other towns from my research are really important and significant steps in restoring uh, trust, not only within, you know, public safety, but within um, town uh, managerial class of people, because some of that, due to what has happened recently and in the past, of course, has uh, been undermined by the actions of, of folks in the town. So what I'm putting to you, Pam, is that I think it's important and we could support you on this, is that a consultant be hired to look at not only the research of the CSWG, the, all the other consultants, but also what, what is put out by post and what is in terms of the contract potentially, so that that can all come together and we have a solid review board that works for this community. So the, um, an external consultant is listed as one of the resources on page one and throughout the document. So I, I mean, I'm anticipating that there, that that is definitely will be a possibility Obviously, you know, there, there needs to have discussions with the town manager and about funding of the, but this is a very specialized area and there are organizations and individuals with this expertise. So, you know, that's, you know, something I, I certainly agree with that, that there should probably be an ex external consultant to hire to sort of guide the, the town through this process. Absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, my my opinion, the committee may uh, differ, but I just feel very strongly that we need um, a consultant or consultants to come in to assure that this is the best type of configuration. Uh, we know we need it, we want it, um, but the best type of configuration, uh, particularly considering as the police, uh, you know, uh, negotiate their contract right now. This is a, a critical moment. Uh, Ms. Pat, you had? Yeah, I was just going to respond to some of uh, Allegra's question as to the makeup of the committee. CSWG deliberately recommended that two members of CSWG should be appointed. So I just want to put that out. Just like we recommended to have two CSWG members to be appointed to, to this group as well. So appointed to the interview committee or appointed? No, appointed to the ROB. So okay. two members of former CSWG group will have to be appointed to join it. Deb? Yeah, and, and I can't remember all the other ones, but we are very kind of um, specific in terms of the other roles so that it, that it was diverse or so that it had like income diversity. It had a whole bunch of different, um, you know, diversity and inclusivity across the board. So um, that would be another thing to really pay attention to for whomever is going to be kind of, you know, following that process. And I just want to, before I ask my question, I just want to be supportive of what um, uh, Dee said in terms of, you know, the stopgap being maybe these three groups, us, um, HRC, and DEI. I think, you know, we need to kind of, you know, work on how that could, could happen. But I think, you know, that might be the way to go because we definitely need something to, to be put in place. In terms of my question, um, Pamela, you, you, you stated about the unions, right? And that they're the supervisor union meeting right now. And then the police officer union is going to be meeting. So I guess, and you know, negotiating. And I, you know, I know that a lot of times when they put these contracts in place, it's like for three years, um, at least, or it's multiple years in terms of contracts being in place. Um, so I guess my thing is, uh, you know, are we priming them with the fact that this is coming? 
So even if they can't be included in negotiations now because it's not up, but are we priming them with that? Because then what you have to do is renegotiate contract when the, the Rob is, is in, you know, ready to go, it has to be brought to them to kind of go through, you know, the, the parts. But I hope you guys are doing like some of the laying of the land right now with the unions. Is that happening? So I'm not a part of the negotiation team, but I know that I've had uh, conversations with uh, Paul about the need for this to be included in the negotiation. In the negotiations, um, I do believe that the negotiations um, do include conversations about post, so that in some way will sort of prime the pump because that's part of the negotiation. Um, t but I, I don't believe that there have been specific conversations about the Resident Oversight Board, but I, I know that there are speci specific conversations about posts that are, or that are occurring. Okay, but yeah, so that might be something to talk to Paul about and, and, and figure some of that stuff out because the unions, you know, obviously I, you know, I love the unions, obviously they're there for a good reason, but it could also be a vet, you know, a, a, a big hall, right? There's going to be places where you all are going to have to really kind of negotiate. So the more time you have with them, you know, really, you know, letting them know what's coming down the pike and things like that, the better it will be because what they don't want is to be, um, you know, sideswiped, right? right? And and just come, you know, all of a sudden now we have this or whatever, you know? Right. And what I mean is that obviously we've been talking about it, but we need to address it to them directly. It's not right. just they hear it on the news or in the newspaper or they one of them joins our meeting, not like that. It has to be officially like you all are, are talking to them about this so that they are on notice that this is coming, you know, mm -hmm. so that they won't come with, oh, well, you all never let us know about anything. You all were just already putting these things together and never talked to any of us. I mean, you all know how to do this. I mean, it's just about making sure that these conversations are being had, even if it can't be included in the negotiations right now per se, because there's no specifics. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, as you've said, you know, um, I'm sure that Paul is aware that he needs to have some conversations about this with the unions and I'm not part of those of the negotiation team. I know that they're having conversations around post and some of the things that um, that would need to occur would also be happening as a part of that post legislation. Um, so I, I think that there is some preliminary, well, I know that there, there are conversations specifically about post. I don't know what specific conversations have been had about the resident oversight board, but I do know that people in the town hall are aware that they need to have those conversations. Okay, yeah, and even if there aren't, if you could just bring that to, to Paul, since obviously you work closely with Paul. I mean, you know, that's what, another reason for you being in these meetings is just to kind of, you know, um, share with him our feedback and what we think needs to happen because you know the, the earlier you start these conversations the better with the union thank you i don't uh allegra or miss pat i don't know Ms. allegra allegra thanks mute i'm sorry i can't find the button um I was just going to say, and I don't know what Ms. Pat's going to say, but I was wondering if maybe I think there's been a lot of talk about post and maybe if it would be helpful to go to the post presentation to give some context if nobody else has any pressing comments that they want to make about the presentation on the Resident Oversight Board. But Ms. Pat. I'll be very brief, extremely brief. So, oh my goodness. So. CSWG was very, very clear that whoever ended up being the DEI director should be involved townwide on issues that will impact especially marginalized group. It pains me that there is contract negotiation with APD and our DEI director is not involved. In fact, I was the one who pushed for two departments. The reason being that we need people of color to be to sit on the same table 
where our senior management in this town, who are mostly white people, and then we're talking about contracts with the union, and we don't, we, we don't have DEI director on it, I would like to propose that CSSJC sent a letter to the town manager, because this is the vision that CSWG had, that we have somebody from marginalized group to be part of decision-making, okay, in issues like this. And the DEI director is the perfect person to do it. I don't mean to put you, um, like uh, put you on what you call it, but I just wanted to put that out. Like, it's really distressing me that the DEI director is not part of the union negotiation contract. Thank you. So um, I'll just say that I believe that the, that the negotiation team had been predetermined before I started in my position and they had already started their work, which um, may be why I you know, wasn't brought in because it was, the work was ongoing. And I, um, I don't know when the team will be determined for the patrolman's uh, uh, union, which I actually would argue would be the more critical uh, union to be a part of those conversations. And even though, and I will just add that, even though I'm not a part of the negotiation team, uh, I know that um, Donna Ray, the previous HR director and I had uh, conversations because she was a part of the negotiation team about this issue. So, you know, there is a way for there to be a communication yeah, regardless of whether I'm actually on the team or not. And I will just point out that this is a department of two, so there's already a lot on my plate. Not to say that it's not important. I don't want to take it on, but you know, there is a lot to do. So I appreciate that, Miss Pat, and and I know I definitely appreciate that, uh, Pam. That it's just two, and there's a lot happening in this town, and that is why the CSWG. Um, really pushed for a DEI director. Um, but I think Ms. Pat mentioned last meeting that we really need like another person, you know, um, to, to handle some of the, the day to day kind of office type of uh, thing. So you can be free to do the larger um work such as you know surveying from top to bottom you know um the the racial ethnic language diversity etc of people that we employ in town you know um and at what levels and salaries you know uh sa salary parity those are the types of things that a dei director in other municipalities uh, uh look at uh, uh an annual or biannual survey of these types of characteristics for um uh the the towns right so those are those are larger things that we definitely want you to attend to at some point and you know i really do ask uh, sincerely how can we help push this along because you know we we see that you know there's already uh, we understand there's on ramping but there's they're struggling to make sure that these areas are, are covered and that is not a slight to you at all it is simply you know trying to to push and and maybe even challenge in in terms of resources uh resource allocation in this community um, of course, the, the town manager is being evaluated currently. I, I really uh, encourage us all to submit a good, bad, or indifferent, um, uh, you know, a, uh, the, you know, comments in terms of uh, the town manager's performance. 
uh, he is under our employ as residents. <laughs> so I, I hope that we all participate in that. But I think this is a critical, uh, critical thing that you need the support in order to uh, do what a DEI director does. So I don't um, know if, if you all are aware, but there is a mass DEI coalition of diversity, equity, and inclusion managers in the state. And they actually um, had a launch party today for a document that they have prepared for municipalities around the Commonwealth. So I've been um, actually a member of that group before I even started in this position. So once the position, my appointment, um, potential appointment was announced, one of the members of the group, Jillian Harvey, who is the DEI director for the town of Arlington reached out. So I've been in uh, communication and participating with that group. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that Jillian would say is that uh, uh, she would advise that the DEI directors don't do the type of full assessment that you're describing, that they use a consultant. Um, I actually have developed an assessment tool that I will be sharing with all of the department heads, which asks them um, a series of questions. It's probably not as complete as a private or external consultant would do, but it does um, begin to have us take a look at the demographics of the various departments, um, both uh, in terms of employees and in terms of individuals that they serve in the community, as well as a series of other questions so that we can start to really unpeel, you know, this onion about where the town is, what people see as their role, how they might enter into the work. Um, so it is my intention to do that high level work and I have gotten started on it. I'm just cautious that, you know, that as a department of two, I don't want the list of, of responsibilities to become so large that I'm ineffective in the things that um, I'm asked to do, you know. So in addition to this um, um, commission, you know, uh, Jen and I are staffing two other boards, and they all have, you know, different agendas that are equally as important that we're trying to work on. So it's not that I um, am uh, minimizing the importance of the task. I'm just trying to make sure that. I can adequately uh, do the tasks that I have already on my plate and, and they're important and they will require a lot of energy. You know, um, it, uh, I, I would say that this one um, commission could be my full-time job without anything uh, added because of the number of things that you have on your plate and because of the depth that is required in order to do them. So. I'm, you know, I'm just trying to moderate what is sure. asked of the department and of me and be realistic about what I can achieve and can't achieve. Absolutely. And yes, definitely. However, it's to be achieved in, in terms of those types of surveys and assessments. But it's a long time coming in, in terms of doing that in the town of Amherst. So um I, I look forward to once that happens, but I know it's it's just another something added to your plate. Okay, so are there any other comment? Oh, Deb, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Just quickly, just to kind of again, um, you know, reaffirm what Dee said, uh, Pamela. I mean, I think what you want to do though is kind of you already like you said, you know, you're new, you're you're trying to get the lay of the land, but you already see there's a lot of work. But also, there's a lot of need, right? Amherst, we've been dealing with these types of, you know, inequities and issues for a long time, and this is the time to really push. So the other part too that you want to be thinking about is really kind of doing an assessment for yourself in your office, right? There's you and Jennifer, like like Dee said, right? You need an administrative uh, assistant or someone to kind of manage more the day to day office, but maybe you all need some more staff people too, right? So that then, because it's going to be important, like what Ms. Pat was saying about having, you know, you and others at the table representing the voices of the marginalized, right? The voices of those that are not heard, their, their issues are not being brought to the table. So I think that this is also for you to kind of think about, right, how 
else to, because again, CSWG, we were under tight timeline. So what, what we did was like, hey, we needed to create this, we needed to, but it's not like we had all the details, right? So as we're going through the, the process and we're seeing everything that's actually having to be, be done, now you and others and with our help, right? Whatever you need, you're gonna get our support to really put the pressure to get it. So think, think bigger, think, think outside the box and really, you know, start making that assessment because I think what you might need is more people for your, for your department. Thank you. Thank you. And I see Earl Miller has joined us. Hello. Hello. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I wasn't earlier. I got this meeting mixed up with uh, another one. I apologize. Okay. So where are we, Allegra, on our agenda? My next. Let's uh, let's head to post. Oh, okay. All righty. Well, um, let's see. Okay, good. You have the the new one. Thank you. Pam. So um, in your packet, I submitted a PDF of uh, this presentation. Since then, uh, I've added about four slides um, and tried to just make things clear. So there, there are uh, slight revisions, but it's mainly the, the same information. Um, so want to just briefly, we're going to talk about what's post. It's already been um, uh, hinted at. Where's the application of post as a system uh, statewide? And then getting to the point, how might we utilize this? And these are just some suggestions and I hope we could think of others. How might we utilize this in Amherst? So if you wanna go to the next one, let's see, could I actually, let, can I, I'm gonna share my screen um, because I, I have it real quick. Let's see. There we go. And okay, can everyone see it? Great. All right, so what post is, um, maybe some of you are familiar with it beyond um, you know, the packet and what we've been discussing, it comes out of uh, a survey uh, coming out of uh, 2019, where, you know, again, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, in the wake of their, their deaths and their murders, um, there was kind of this top to bottom look uh, at policing in Massachusetts. And it's not that it's not, you know, it, it, people contest it, particularly the, some of the police organizations, but they did find in doing a survey that there are some needs and some troubling uh, aspects about how localized our training in uh, the state of Massachusetts is. And what that means is that each uh, municipality, each town has um, the, the ability to kind of set their own standards. There's some, you know, uh, set their own standards for training. And it's not something that on the state level that is fully mandated. So that means it differs right, from community to community. And so those are some of the things that they really wanted to look at. They also wanted to look at, and this comes out of CSWG, um, how are we able to track, you know, troubling police officers that have had complaints, right? So uh, background checks for every officer in the state, um, mandatory certification processes uh, for police officers and, and training, and then um, charge with creating uh, more accountability so that there's guidelines um, in, in the cases of where police officers have been found to, uh, you know, behave improperly, that there's a decertification process, suspension of certification, reprimand, et cetera, for misconduct. Those things were not um, made, you know, they, they were different from each community. Um, so they wanted to have it more statewide uh, be the same. And so that's why they developed 
posts. And so here are some of the other findings. One of the things that I found really uh, interesting, and of course this has been corrected since post has been instituted, is that the state of Massachusetts was one of four in the, the United States that did not have one of these comprehensive types of systems where things were more uniformed in terms of policing. So we were, you know, again, handling things on these kind of local jurisdictions um, independently. And there was very little oversight on the state level. The other thing I thought was really interesting that again, this, this parallels some of the critique of CSWG is that within the training that it lacked a kind of curriculum diversity and that had to do with, you know, kind of cultural, um, you know, uh, knowing uh, different people's cultures and that, uh, that type of thing in, in different communities. Um, they didn't have that. And so again, that was not very uniformed. And that indeed, and this is still uh, happening, that there's a shortage of training instructors. So even if those municipalities wanted some type of specialized training for cultural competency, um, there's very few people to, to handle that. And so these uh, are their recommendations that came out of post. Again, it started in 2019 with that survey, um, was that you'd ensure officers are meeting training requirements. And by having these training requirements and establishing standards, that becomes part of their certification as officers. Like they would actually have to go through this, including cultural competency and the like to be certified, okay? Um, and that um, uh, they would continue to evaluate the training curricula and instructor certification. So not just, of course, the police, but the instructors. Um, and that would be something that they would continually do, again, on the state level, making it more uniform instead of very individualized locally. Um, so, you know, here you have the, the set minimum training standards for certification and police licensure uh, require departments to track and this comes out of CSWG again, uh, departments to track fired and problematic officers to make sure that they are not unknowingly hired when leaving one department for another in the same or different state. That is something you would assume that we do, you know, as a state, but it's not happening. Some bad officers uh, are fired, they leave uh, one locality and they get hired in another. And so that's a, a pretty serious problem. Um, and of course, the ultimate goal is to restore public trust. And so their idea was to develop these four databases, two type of internal databases, and then two public databases. And what's important about these databases and tracking police officers is that one of those databases would actually have um, complaints attached to them, uh, any types of, you know, on the, on the good end, it would have the certifications uh, attached to it, but you would be able to track any officer where a complaint has been filed or that was, um, you know, problematic in terms of, you know, domestic violence, let's say. And these are things that, again, are, are being contested by police unions. Um, because they feel that that's an invasion of privacy, but this is what the post committee is pushing for. So they're still, the, these are some guidelines that they are still working on, but this is the proposal. These four databases and the two public are important uh, for our uses. So the public database, as uh, the quote from uh, Anike Zuniga, who's a director of POST, I imagine initially the ability for someone to type up a name and see fundamentally some disciplinary history and certification status. I think that is ultimately really important when we think of um, negotiating with our uh, police for the new contract. Um, this is pretty strong to have such a, data, a database in place because we can find out, you know, are they fit to, to serve? 
Are they fit to serve? And then do they have some cultural competency? You know, if so, what types of certifications? So this is uh, just kind of repeating some of that. The, the important part of this, uh, the database would include information about investigations against law uh, enforcement officers, um, including suspensions, terminations, resignations, right? To avoid discipline. So it's not like, oh, they, they just left. It's like, well, why did they leave? those things would be attached to it. So thus far, uh, as, as in my research, it's 4,500 records, but we're talking about 15 to 20,000 full-time police officers at the very least. So the commission is kind of behind uh, uh, in doing this and compiling the information. Some of it has to do with their local uh, and, uh, you know, unions uh, that are contesting um, having this database be released to the public. I did want to share, however, just to see how this coincides with some of the things that the CSWG and 7Gen worked on. Um, here is right out of the report, we um, show evidence of the need for um, these types of databases. Uh, former police uh, chief uh, that came and consulted uh, here with UMass and uh, the local police, he said that we did not have um, a very good system to lodge complaints and to the, the previous conversation about the review board that uh, they recommended a civilian advisory group, right? That would not only help in terms of community police relations, but again, it would add transparency, right? So these are things that since 2014, this community um, uh, has need, of course it was needed before, but you know, they, they, uh, they knew they were made aware of the need, okay? So then, here is um, part of how POST handles complaints and incident reports. And the language here to me is very strong. When we were talking about the, the Amherst 9 and what occurred and had someone complained, you know, who's gonna complain or do they feel safe to complain? Those types of de debates actually um, aren't even important if there is an issue having to do with police behavior that is suspect, there should be a complaint. Here it says complaints, and this comes straight out of the document itself. So you can have this as a PDF and go to the document. Complaints can originate from a member of the public as an external complaint, from personnel at the agency, an internal complaint or incident or any other source. And that they are required two business days of receipt of a complaint alleging the misconduct of an officer. So that officer may be cleared in the end, but these are things that should be reported just as a, a point of process. And here are the types of complaints, alleging bias on the basis of race, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, and then two, complaints regarding use of force, excessive, prohibited, or deadly force. And then three, actions that resulted in serious bodily injury or death, right? So those are much more serious, but one, complaints alleging bias, those are things that are, are, again, that they're specifying. Those are things that uh, are legitimate complaints. And then there's another area of complaints that are regarded related to being unprofessional. And this is their language, unprofessional. Um, if the complaint is related to minor matters, including discourtesy and basic work rule violations, tardiness, et cetera, um, please refer to post regulations to maintain a log of these complaints, which need 
uh, not be submitted to post, but made available upon request. So again, the database would track these types of complaints lacking in professional kind of decorum, professional behavior. But it's not necessarily an, uh, a, you know, something, an infraction that they could be fired for. However, complaints and incidents that are not related to minor matters as described above and fall in the category of officer misconduct or unprofessionalism should also be submitted to post and subcategorize as follow. Now understand what I'm reading is a part of the guidelines of post. There's a whole section on advisory that I'm gonna get into at the very end, but these are guidelines, which are the stronger legal language. And maybe that's something, um, Pam, you can uh, qualify as to what's guideline and what's advisory, but the guidelines are the stronger legal language. And so here, unprofessionalism, policy or procedure violations, conformance to laws, conduct, unbecoming and untruthfulness, all of those are areas um, that are, uh, you know, that can be uh, cited as, as areas to report. So we're not gonna watch the video, but it is connected to the PDF. Here you have uh, evidence of how POST is working already in the state of Massachusetts. 19 police officers uh, no longer certified to serve. Um, and it has to do with these guidelines that have been put in place with post. And you can watch the, the little uh, news segment on that. Now, the whole point of this is to suggest that with these stronger guidelines, there is a way in which we could have better police accountability. And on the police end, it would restore trust in terms of community and police relations. So important, of course, for us to look at the collective bargaining that's taking, that is now going to take place within um, a few months um, and that we fully understand how the non-disclosure clause, and this is why I was saying, Pam, maybe it's worth, you know, again, getting somebody hiring a consultant soon, because the non-disclosure clause that is already part of the contract, that's something now we can reopen in relationship to the post guidelines. So my question, does the non-disclosure clause contradict the legal mandate of post? And is it used to report or track complaints of officers, right? How can we utilize that? Because again, that accountability is really important. Are we currently using any of the guidelines of post? I, I would like to know that as, as not only a resident, but as the CSSJC, especially regarding police complaints. Now I've gone on the police website. There is an area where you can um, uh, put you know, any type of compliments or, you know, the, the good deeds that the, the police are doing. I'm certainly, you know, there's, we know that there's certainly a lot of that, but then you go to the complaint section and you have to put um, your, uh, your personal information. So I'll show you that after I finish this, because I'm tying up. Um, and I, I think that, well, I know that, in the research that we did, people are, um, you know, fear having their personal information shared like that because they're afraid of retaliation. So, and here, if post is not used, then we should stress the importance of usage in the next bargaining agreement with APD. So I think what you were suggesting, Pam, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that they aren't necessarily using post currently, that this might be the, um, the start of putting this into the new contracts. Um, so, so go ahead. So the uh, police department is in compliance with post the way in which the legislation works. Um, each department uh, is asked to submit a, um, a basically a, a third of the of their police department records to the post commission. So over a three year period, the commission will review all of the officers in the Commonwealth. 
So uh, the Amherst Police Department has submitted all of the records for the officers that they needed to submit um, for this time frame for this first review, and they're fully in compliance with the post requirements for submission of certification of officers. And I do believe that they're um, that they've followed all of the policy um, requirements of post. Uh, they are currently, I think it's a supervisor's union that is currently in negotiation about the collective bargaining or it, it, over their collective bargaining agreement. And they are having discussions about post as part of that discussion. So um, it's post to state law. So the collective yeah. bargaining agreement cannot be in opposition of state law. So those requirements will be a part of the, of the new agreement. Great, thank you for that clarification. Um, I also want to, one, I see your, your hand is up real quick, um, wanted to offer, here is also within post, and understand there, we, I just read some of the guidelines. This is part of the advisory section of post, which is, uh, you know, again, maybe Pam could uh, distinguish what's the difference, but the advisory section has a whole section on de-escalation, um, and disengagement uh, in, in terms of interactions with minor children. So children under the age of 18. And so you could see here in my little rough <laughs> outline here to highlight it, um, to issue guidance as to developmentally appropriate de-escalation and disengagement tactics, techniques and procedures, and other alternatives to the use of force of minor children that may take into account contextual factors, including, but not limited to the person's age, disability status, developmental status, mental health, linguistic limitations, or other mental or, or mental or physical condition. So those are advisories that are issued as a part of post. And I just think of, you know, how that interaction that we saw might have been different had um, this had been attended to perhaps in a different way. Um, so I, I did want to offer that. And Allegra, go ahead, because I'm gonna go on to this next slide that gets a bit uh, more detailed, yes. Um, I was just gonna say, I think in reading the LEAP report that had been put out um, when CSWG was putting together their part B report, a, there were some things that the LEAP report flagged as possibly being out of compliance with post in terms of some of the disciplinary things, for example, like something going off somebody's record within one year. Um, so I think I can go back through the LEAP report and kind of look at where the suggestions to bring into compliance with the post regulations would be, um, but that is I something think you're that- right that LEAP had definitely flagged as there were some, some areas that needed to change. I think you're right. It, if, I think we need to find that spot and that page, but um, I, I think you're, you're right about that. And I remember that that being a point of discussion uh, when the, the LEAP portion of the report came out for the CSWG. Mm -hmm. um, so that is going to contradict that. So that's something that has to be uh, negotiated, right? And um, they can't be out of compliance, period. So here, the training certification for interactions with, with children, um, there's a whole certification area for that. And um, they should be, this is something, you know, Earl, um, maybe even uh, to attend to here. Law enforcement officers should be trained in developmentally appropriate trauma-informed and racially equitable tactics to de-escalate minor children. So including communication strategies. So I think, you know, this is really important, which avoid threats and intimidation and promote calm, age-appropriate language, provide choices and allow ample time for compliance. This is something, again, that we witnessed the the police didn't uh, did did not <laughs> do any of that, you know. At least within the clip that 
we saw. Now, uh, thank goodness it all ended, you know, uh, calmly. But I, I, I actually, going back to the children, it ended calmly because the children stay calm. And then lastly here, this is coming out of the, the same advisory that education and training specifically, training and communication, stabilization and crisis intervention strategies, right? Strategies and techniques should encompass and they, they offer the following, active, reflective, empathetic listening, rapport building, uh, affect management and crisis negotiation and response. If we recall, the officers, and I, I don't know the, the female officer, and unfortunately um, she will live in my memory, but the, what she was saying to the young people in having no rights, you know, um, there were others there saying the same thing, but, you know, again, affect management, crisis negotiation and response, rapport building. I, I didn't see any of that taking place. So again, this is how some of this could be utilized, right, in training and certification of the APD. Yes, that was you, Pam. Yeah, I, I just want to um, correct. So it was not the female officer who oh, made this, this statement. So I think we need to, to correct that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I guess I remembered it uh, incorrectly. So, um, but the officer's there. And um, I think it's, you know, again, really important that we look to um, these new strategies and these new guidelines as a means of training our APD in appropriate ways to interact with our young people and, and with the residents of this community. So that is what I have to offer in terms of uh, posts, there's a lot more, of course, that you could find on the Massachusetts.gov website uh, in terms of posts, very specific uh, areas within the, the guidelines. And like I said, they have the section on advisory that includes interaction with uh, youth. So, um if I may, as, as a follow-up, I would like to say that I am aware that um, two members of the Amherst Police Department uh, recently attended a de-escalation uh, training. That, that the, these are the two officers, or officer and a patrolman, who are responsible for providing training to the other officers in the department on de-escalation techniques. So I know that there are um, have been some efforts for them to gain additional knowledge and training on this topic. And that was actually uh, a regional event that was hosted at, at, at uh, UMass Amherst. And I think, um, I know the invitation went out to probably more than 50 departments. So it was a pretty large regional event. Okay, thank you. Earl? So just quickly, um, currently we do not have any role in the training of, of APD uh, on any level. Um, we do have some trainings coming up. We will invite uh, all of our public safety partners to participate, but I, I just want to, I don't have any ability to influence their attendance or, or, you know, frankly, do anything other than invite. So no, the reason why, thank you for that clarification. I wasn't suggesting that you all were, were doing the training. It's just that when we think of trauma-informed, you know, and I, I, I think of our colleague Allegra that, you know, is a social worker and reminds us that, you know, um, the interactions with police, um, for many people, uh, it's very traumatic and it's very triggering. And so um, to have some type of um, uh, training that keeps that at the center, particularly in dealing with our youth, I think is, is terribly important. And so I am thankful for the guidelines, but you know, it's like, what about the training? Training is something that also within our research, we found with CSWG and 7Gen and uh, a LEAP probably report, um, that training only goes so far, right? It's, it's the people and it's how we hold them accountable in terms of the use of that training, right? So, um, no, I, I appreciate that, Earl. Any questions or comments? 
I mean, overall, I'm hopeful, but I, I really, you know, um, it's how, how will it be in, included, right? Not only within the contract, but how will it be included within our own APD? Yeah, um, I think it was Allegra and then Deb. I'll defer to Deb because I already said something. No, I mean, I think that, that that's really what I wanted. You know, thank you for, for doing the presentation, D. Um, but I really just wanted to kind of get a sense of, I guess, you know, are we going to have, like, or who do we get the information from to kind of see how is APD, you know, actually doing in regards to post, right? Um, are they following everything that is there that's, you know, that's a requirement? I know that, Pamela, that you said that it seems like they are, quote unquote, whatever that means. Uh, but I really want to get more into the details, into the weeds. So, but I'm not sure, you know, how do you go about that? I guess would be the question. So I um, I don't have a, a specific answer for that, I, other than to say that I have uh, spoken with the chief and he told me that the um, Amherst Police Department was in compliance with the post regulations and that they had gone through the first one third of the officers as they're required to do. Uh, I don't know, um, from my review of the post, I don't know if there's a requirement that there's a public disclosure of the activities that they're doing in order to comply. So those training recommendations or any of those things. So I, I'm willing to ask, but I, um, I, don't, I don't know of a mechanism for how that would be publicly disclosed other than to, to state that they're in compliance in the last uh, news report that I saw about posts was that the commission was um, had not completed all of the reviews that they were required to within this time frame because the Boston Police Department had not complied, but every other police department um, had complied with their regulations. So um, I know that there was at one point a list of those communities that were not in compliance um, published. Um, but every indication is that uh, Amherst has complied with everything that they are required to do at this point. And at this point, what you're saying is that I think it's A through F maybe that they've submitted. Right. So right. that's how far behind they are in the sense right. that they've only, they're doing it alphabetically. They've gotten A through F. And so there's the whole other set of the alphabet that they gotta go through to submit records. Right. So yeah. the, the, expecta the expectation was that it would be a three year process in order for them to do like the 15,000 or 16,000. So, you know, A through F was the just, I guess, by names, the, the law, the a third of the group, and then they'll go through the remainder of, of the of the alphabet. Um, but I, I um, you know, we have, relatively speaking, a very small police force. So it would probably be quite easy for the chief, although I can't speak for him, right, to find out whether the remainder of the police force, like, you know, a third of our, uh, uh, two thirds of our police force is still a relatively sp small number. So um, I'm sure they know whether all of their officers would meet the requirements or, or not. Right. And when you talk also about requirements, that's the certifications that they um, have to, to uh, participate in. Right. So in Amherst, and this was as part of the report that the CSWG did. So Amherst is one of like 91 towns and uh, cities and towns in the Commonwealth that has an accredited um, police department. So there's over 351 police departments in the Commonwealth, and only about a third of them are accredited. And Amherst is fully accredited. So it would be my uh, speculation, good probability that all of our officers are going to meet the requirements um, for post for certification because the department is already accredited. So it it as it operates at a higher standard than some other uh, police departments in the Commonwealth. And yeah, and so that brings up, and then we'll go to Allegra, um, a diversification of the types of trainings. And so it's to look at what type of training, uh, not only statewide, but locally, 
that our uh, police department is uh, participating in. So we just heard one, you know, a new de-escalation uh, training, uh, which is great. But um, there, you know, again, there's there's a, others out there that may be mm -hmm. applicable or, 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 you know, appropriate for us. Allegra. Um. I guess I'm just having a little bit of a hard time thinking about like trauma informed and people carrying a gun in like the same sentence. Um, I mean, I work in the courthouse and I see police every day and it's still scary for me to see a police officer with a gun holstered walking down the hallway to the, to the water cooler, you know, it's, it's triggering and that's in, you know, I'm, I'm doing my job. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not in fear of anything or, you know, so I can, I can't really imagine being a young person interacting with a person who has a gun and, th and thinking that, you know, that, oh, that was really a trauma informed interaction. And I, I feel better because this person has had this specific training. And I, 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 see kind of what you say d that you know training is important and train having uniform training we kind of know better what we're dealing with but it is about how a person uses that training and if if they're not using that training then then what good is the training and i guess i guess my concern is that by increasing the types of trainings that a police officer needs to have that will be inadvertently funneling more money into the system of policing rather than funneling money into alternative programs such as CRESS or even just community services that address a lot of the things that people who might be coming into contact with the police are struggling with, whether that's substance use or housing issues or you know, job instability, immigration issues. You know, I think I, I get a little prickly when I think about spending more money on police training when I think that perhaps if we were spending money in the community instead, we wouldn't need police as much. So, I mean, that is just, I don't know if it's a critique at post or just like a, I don't know what we do with my jumbled thoughts, but I just, Kind of wanted to say that because it, it made me a little, a little concerned. So personally, I agree with you, but realizing after reading the guidelines and the advisories and post that each community is not to say may they're not making it up, <laughs> but they're deciding on uh, what type of training they're deciding on uh, their, their different approaches and that it's not uniformed, you know, statewide. That made me a bit anxious because we're, we're talking about people, right? So we're talking about fallible humans that we are and making those types of decisions and not to say that policy and procedure and bylaws and all that or any, because they're made by people but at least there's a, a point of reference to say, oh, this police officer or this department stepped out of line based on the, the state guidelines. And we know what we're dealing with. If it's, you know, oh, by the Amherst guidelines and not by the, you know, Arlington or Pittsfield guidelines, that makes me kind of anxious. I mean, I do think like, you know, what happened in Pittsfield this past year, where the person with mental illness was shot. You know, what happened? Was it a lack of training? Was it a lack of, you know, de-escalation? I mean, I, I don't know. But at least we have a reference point that we can look at and say, oh, well, they weren't following these particular guidelines. So now let's look at that. So I, I agree. It's like, you know, do we need more money put into training? I think we need some type of uh, overall, and that is just my opinion, 
some type of uh, overall model of what an expectation and accountability for the police in the state of Massachusetts. I mean, if we're going to have them, then yeah, I want something that, you know, that that goes across the board, that it doesn't differ from town to town. I don't know, like to hear anyone else's uh, ideas around the use of post. I just want to add. I just want to say one quick thing because I think I'm losing my internet. I th I'm in Agawam. I think I'm I'm gonna lose my internet connection. I I think the Pittsfield situation is one you may actually want to look more into because it was de-escalated. There were actually two police engagements in that event. Um, it was an incident of self-harming. Uh, the first officer was able to de-escalate and disarm the person. The second officer, uh, which was a second call, uh, was actually the officer to, to shoot the shots. Um, I just think there's a lot for everyone to learn about kind of long-term de-escalation from that situation. Okay. I'll look into it, but it, it does ha having, uh, you know, a loved one uh, with severe mental illness uh, that it just, it always makes me anxious. Um, and to know that that happened so close to home, but I, I will look into it because I was, I was agreeing with you, actually, I think yeah. uh, part of it is, is, you know, what there is some level of risk in, in folks with mental health challenges being in the community just because their behavior differs from ours. But um, statistically, they're just far more likely to be the victims of violence than, than the perpetrators. All yeah. right, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm gonna be out for today. Uh, sorry, I, I missed uh, the rest of the meeting. I'll, I'll see you all soon. All right, um, Deb or Miss Pat, I don't know who was next. Um, so I'll, I'll go. Um, so with this over here, what you were saying, Allegra, in terms of, you know, I'm in agreement with what you were saying too, of, uh, you know, in regards to the trainings. And I think that's something that we kind of struggled a lot with, with CSWG, right? Because we were, we were like, you know, we're trying to recommend as an alternative to the police and really start limiting um, the numbers of police. And that's why we're saying, you know, no new hires, you know, when, when, when they retire or they leave or, or things like that, right? Um, to do a transition, and especially as Crest kind of ramps up and, and things like that. But I think as what, what we saw with, with the Amherst 9, right, while we do have police, <laughs> we do need training, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because if we don't have the training, if they're not getting these types of, of trainings for the escalation, because they still are out there, they still are armed, and they still are dealing with, with, with um, you know, responding to complaints. Um, and it's too bad that, that, Earl left because, of course, I wanted to ask him about press and so on and so forth and how they're doing, and especially in terms of response to um, noise complaints and things like that, because really they should only, we, we just wanted the police to be dealing with criminal um, violations and all non-criminal would be press that would be responding to it. So so that's the thing. I mean, a, a, until there is a, a, a total phase out, let's say, or something like that, there does money needs to be funneled, you know, to training and, and but but obviously training that works, not the check the box type of training, right? It has to be who's who's doing the training. Is it long term? Is it something that's really been effective as opposed to just the the, the one time, you know, uh, kind of training just to say, yeah, we did it. And really, you don't utilize anything that the training uh, imparted. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pat? So I'll be very quick. Um, thank you, Dee, for the presentation. So I'm looking at the time, and we have quite busy um, agenda. And I was wondering if people have more points to make on post. Um, if not, maybe we should move on. I have a lot to talk about, about our APD. I, for myself, I don't believe in, in trading, I'm sorry. Nothing is going to change. I, I, I was very clear with CSWG, it is what it is. Until there is accountability, no amount of training will change these people. And it has nothing to do with race. It has to do with blue code, protecting each other. Until there is accountability, training means nothing. 
people who watch CSWG knew where I stand when it comes to dividing resources, money to police training. It's not going to work. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. And, yeah. and I just want to end on it's a way to, you know, on one end to hold them accountable when they are employed. Um, but it is limited. So I, I agree with you there. If we want to go ahead and move on to the next item on the agenda. Well, I, can, can I interject just real quick yes. in terms of what, what Ms. Pat did say? So what are we going to focus on in terms of the agenda? Because the, the hour is getting late, you know? So uh, can we just prioritize, you know, the kind of the, what we're going to, because I'm assuming like we're going to talk about the statements from the families and youth and possibly victim compensation, but I, I don't know if there's time to do much more. <laughs> right. If I may, I think the MS9 families approached me and I promised them that it will get into our agenda, you know, to respect them because I know we haven't had any action from the town council that we prioritize that. And they specifically requested that their, their voices be read tonight. In addition to having uh, their um, documents as part of public packet. So we should prioritize that. So I, and I also, agree. And also for the compensation fund as well. Yes. I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to say, unless Allegra, you got some word from Lynn, we, we have not gotten any official response from uh, Lynn or the town council to our letter. So um, can I say, yeah, can I say very few, I'll be very quick. I wanted to say it at the beginning when we started our meeting, but uh, during the member report or something like that, I have to say it, okay? Ames is a, uh, a tale of two towns. We have majority BIPOC youth, their rights being taken away from them. And the town council doesn't have any time to come to decision or get back to us. We are not even on the agenda. However, we have Jones building. What do I care about that? They spent so much time and then they were able to make quick decision. We have honest media, not sure about support funding from our town government. And yet it's okay for us to borrow more money for Jones Library. I don't get this town. I do not get this town. I just want to put that out. Town Council is so important for them to decide on, on Jones Library. They, we're talking about human lives, about our youth, our future generation. We have not heard anything from the police, nothing from the Town Council. And then people want CSWG. People want anti-racism work. People want diversity, inclusion. What is this in our town? What are we doing? Are we just wasting our time with this group? What are we doing? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Do you wanna go ahead, uh, you and Allegra present uh, about the letter? Cause I think that's next, isn't that next on the agenda? It is. Um, Ms. Pat, do you want me to read it? Do yes, you... please, yeah. Oh. If you, you can start to... with the youth, with the youth okay. first. Um, so the first document that we have is the victim, the excuse me, the voices of the BIPOC youth from the Amherst Nine, um, and it's a series of quotes. But well, would you be able to just put it on though? Share your screen. I think it would be more powerful to kind of show the words Here, and kind I of can... keep scrolling them as you're reading them. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I, it's on my screen and I'm like, oh, well, everyone could see. It. <laughs> all right. Sorry. Can you all see it? I'm going to make it larger. I think they wanted to start with the youth one first. Yes. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yes. <laughs> nope. There we go. Okay. Um, our rights were taken away on 7-5-2022. I never thought I would hear those words in this area from our police. 
I listened to the police when they said we couldn't talk, had no rights, could not use our phones, could not call our guardians and or parents. And so I just didn't move, didn't speak and complied to not make anything worse. I've been taught that if I speak respectfully with police, it's okay to ask questions. Well, I thought I could, but I did not dare to. And I was confused on why I could not call my home and I did not dare speak up to ask anything. Will I always be punished because I have a tint to my skin and now even more with me speaking up? Will we need to now be fearful of retaliation from the police? I'm not looking for any trouble. I just want to live peacefully. Am I safe to walk alone or with anyone really? Now anxiety plays a major part of my life because of police making me feel unsafe. I worry if I'm okay to go anywhere, especially alone. I worry for my friends. I worry about how much the experiences with the Amherst police has taken from my concentration on school and my studies because my safety and being of color was something I thought I would not have to worry about in this area. To what degree am I to be of concern for my safety? I was at my friend's house and came outside. I saw sirens. I saw my friend get questioned by the police. My friends who were in a parked vehicle at a parking spot had a flashlight shown at them. They were told to exit the truck and sit on the curb with the rest of us. I started to record the altercation. I did this in case the police said we did something wrong. If I had a run in with the police, I would hope someone would record it too. If anything happened, it would be on video. Anything could have happened. The police were yelling, power tripping. They were yelling we were detained. They were yelling we had no rights. Being detained technically means you're not allowed to leave. No one had the courage to leave. The fear of the police is instilled in us. My heart was racing. I was scared. I had no rights. I didn't know what to think. I felt lost. I didn't know who I could look to for safety and security in a time of distress. Our emotions were at all, all time high. Nothing good comes from the police. My view of the Amherst police is that they are up to no good and looking to cause problems. I know this from experience. Toward the end of the encounter, I thought we would be free to go, but they had us call our parents. We couldn't just go on about our business. We had to continue to do as they said. We were not free to leave on our own accord. My friend's mom had to take me home. If I complain, they may come after my family. I didn't want that negative attention. I feel I am stuck. I want something to happen, but I want to protect my family at the same time. I keep busy to not think about what happened to us, but it doesn't work. We talk or think about this incident almost every day because we see the police every day. I am a student who has lived in Amherst my whole life, basically. Outside of school and studies, next comes sports and family, then friends. I've never been one who wants or causes trouble. I've been taught that if I could trust, I've been taught that I could trust the Amherst police to call on in an emergency or in need of help. That's been taken away from me by the Amherst police. There's been more than a few times police had made me feel less than. I have over time wondered what I did, what did I do wrong to be treated as if I'm some hoodlum? I stay respectful and know I'm not doing anything wrong, so why? Even though I have tried to see otherwise, I can't help but see a common denominator every time, color and race. I do as I'm told, and even though respect is not reciprocated, I, am still, I still am humble. Give and show respect and follow directions when encountered by the Amherst police, as well as in general. That's how I was raised, it's instilled in me. And this incident doesn't surprise me. I've been questioned by the police before for things I am not involved in. When I was in middle school, my friends and I were in front of the firehouse next to CVS, waiting for other friends to join us after getting their food. The police had us go inside the CVS. They were responding to a call about a theft at the CVS. They said they wanted to see if any one of us matched the description of the suspect. They had us go inside of CVS to compare each one of us to surveillance camera footage inside the store. 
When a girl in our group identified the person who was white, the police just said nothing was going to happen to him and he should just return the item. The police didn't call our parents then. Nothing came out of the incident and my friends and I continue to have bad experiences with the police. Thank you, Allegra. You want to read the, does anybody want to read the parents' uh, voices? Does anybody want to volunteer? Or can, is there a way to sum it up? I'm just worried about time as well, I guess. Well, basically it's the same, um, what the document they, they shared uh, the last time we met, but they made some adjustment. If people have read it, then we just, uh, move on, but they wanted us to read it. I, yeah, I, I mean, we can read it. I, I can read it. I okay, go ahead. It. But do you have it in front? Yeah, it, yes, it's, it's right okay. here. Yeah. All right. So September 7th, uh, 2022. It has been a little over two months since two armed and uniformed uh, Amherst police officers responded to a noise complaint at a working class apartment complex complex as many were settling in from Independence Day festivities. Police with their cruisers and flashlights pulled into the apartment complex parking lot, found a group of young teens to assert their power and authority and deprive them wrongfully of their constitutional rights. The teens were instructed to sit on the pavement and in a row like suspects in a police lineup. Of the nine youth involved, six are black and Latino. They are our sons. Try to put yourself in our son's shoes. They were simply visiting and congregating in a friend's parking lot to provide a, accompaniment and comfort in a distressing or unfortunate time when they heard a friend was stuck with a flat tire. This is what grown-ups call mutual aid. They weren't going anywhere until that friend's problems were resolved. Our sons were the wrong color at the wrong time. Or some who have lived here longer than the ages of our boys will tell it like it is that our color has always been the wrong color for Amherst and based on color have always and will forever be a target, a target of unfair punishment, interrogation, detention, and harassment. Our children have been traumatized not by brutal physical force, but, the, but by the blunt force of racism and the suffocation of racial profiling that they have witnessed and now have experienced themselves over and over again. We look forward to continuing solidarity work with the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee to achieve our goals while protecting our children, the identi their identities and their future. Quote from parents, it is just so unfortunate I chose to live here and raise children because I thought it would be different here because of diversity. Our children feel unsafe regarding what they have seen in the, in the US with police and young people of color as well as adults and they thought they were protected here. They took away the trust and belief of safety they and we are supposed to have while our kids are out there. Why didn't they make them feel safe as they waited for AAA? Parents teach kids to trust the police and call on them for help. They took that away. The chief of police chalking it up to having a slice of pizza with our children to smooth out the harm is offensive and disrespectful. Nothing close to that is going to melt away feelings of unease and unrest in our hearts and minds from the damage done. Thank oh, that's it. Thank you, Deborah. So no these documents were also sent to Human Rights Commission. So the question becomes, how is the uh, town going to come up with their final uh, investigation? Because the families and the youth want their voices being included. As I referenced earlier in our meeting, HRC, Human Rights Commission, don't actually have any, any I shouldn't say any power, but the bylaw make it impossible for them to even act you know, in terms of um, coming up with um, their recommendation or whatever. Philip, you can help me out. And again, I encourage people to listen to the HRC meeting last week. The emotion was raw. All the members who attended that night were very uh, powerful in what they spoke. And I don't want to give it away. Just go watch it. Go watch it. We need to support this um, MS night people. And if people have comments, uh, otherwise we'll go to the next um, item of uh, Justice Compensation Fund. I, I just want to say that the, it's really powerful hearing our youth who have grown up here and are, are growing up here um, talk so, 
so negatively about our community, you know? And I have on the opposite end, I have heard uh, from majority uh, community people, you know, speak so fondly about Amherst, like this is an idyllic place. And I mean, not all of them, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that in contrast to what these youth have shared and my own children have shared. So, you know, I, I sympathize and empathize and really feel the, the trauma that these young people uh, have endured, you know, and, and will continue to remember this community as uh, and, and, and impacting them in such a negative way. It, it really, really saddens me, you know, including how the parents uh, come away uh, from this. And like you say, Ms. Pat and others have said, where's the accountability so that they could feel whole? So I know you're, you're gonna talk a little bit about that, Deborah. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's some of the same things, right? I mean, obviously, you know, so heartened and, and thank um, the youth and, and the parents for coming forward and talking about this very traumatic and difficult issue um, but as you were saying, Dee, you know, us as, as people of color and black people in specific, you know, that's, you know, parents as parents and us with, with black males with kids and everything, that's the type of stuff that we are afraid of every day when they go outside the house, right? That they're going to encounter the police, that they're going to have those types of negative encounters. And now we have the Amherst 9 that had that, right? And we have video, we have all of those things. So for me, I guess my thing is, you know, and you kind of asked that question, but I really want to, what are we going to do? Because the town council has not responded. We have not gotten any definitive investigatory report from the police. Things are just lagging. They haven't even responded to our email, not even had the de decency to respond to us to say, hey, we're considering it. We're deliberating. I mean, something, you know what I'm saying? It's just like no response whatsoever to even like, you know, engage us. And, and here we are two weeks later and this thing keeps up. It's happened in July. And, and you've you've heard from parents at our last meeting, and then you heard from from young people now and everything. So, and we zero silence, nothing. So, what are we going to do? What's our next step? That's what I'm interested in knowing because obviously they're not doing anything. So, what's our next step? So, if I may, and I'm not claiming that you know some of the ideas come from me. I have been actively involved with some of the um, MS-9. I think that um, there has to be personal healing, okay? Whether or not APD admits or not, they're guilty. They, they denied, you know, the kids right, period. That was misconduct, okay? And kids are hurting. And this is lifelong for these kids. It's just not, it's not going to go away that quickly. So they need to heal personally. And let's face it, if some of these kids, their parents are like middle class, upper middle class, they'd be lawyering up because I know that's what I would do. Okay, they'll be lawyering up. I think, I think we need to listen to the youth and the families what they think will help them heal, start the process of, of healing. And I don't want to hear that the town, yeah, we don't have money, we don't have resources. No, but we have money to put into Jones Library. I'm sorry, we have money, okay? Secondly, we need to remind, our coaches need to remind the town council chair, Ms. Lynn, they need to put us in our agenda for their next town council meeting. We need to go back there, okay? We need to push. We want anti-racism in this town. It's going to you know, require some work. We need to do that. We need to, get, we need to get in touch with the police chief and the town manager. What is the final investigation report? Like we need to be proactive. 
And if our coaches don't mind, you know, we need to, you know, send emails demanding that we, we put, they put us on the agenda next time. This is the most important issue in our town. The event of July 5th would define Amherst in 2022. History, will, it will go down in, our, in history, how we responded. So mostly BIPOC youth, okay? I know we're doing all other good stuff, but this is going to define us this, you know, for 2022. So everything else don't matter. This is the, the highest priority because we're dealing with human beings. So we need to keep pushing. This is what CSWG did. There were some town councillors who wanted to shut us down while we're making recommendations, but we stuck together. And I'm saying that with our, our group here. We have to be united. We can, we can disagree and that's okay, but we cannot let noises distract us. We need to stay focused and push and push. And that's why we have this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, did you wanna talk about the compensation fund as a part of uh, sure. the action? Sure. Allegra, you want to go? I can go. Um, we can do it together. Yeah. Um, so I know Miss Pat had said last time she was hoping somebody would work with her and I was interested in doing that. Um, I don't know where it just went. It was just right here. And Dee, do you still have it? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I have it. It's up right there. Yeah. Oh. Um, and I, Ms. Pat, do you want to speak to the importance of using the word justice rather uh, than justice? Ab absolutely. So uh, several weeks ago, um, I, I think the first time we talked, to, uh, we met, we were talking about July 5th. The idea of victim compensation fund was what I was uh, using. And then the families got back to me and the youth. And in order not to confuse people because there is already victim compensation fund that is administered statewide or something. That's not what I meant. So the idea of justice compensation funds, you know, the word justice seems to empower. It's an empowering word. And so we switch from victim compensation fund to justice compensation fund. And when we talk about fund, we're talking about money from our town, not somewhere else. Um, so basically, why do we want this fund? So the reason basically is that police, APD officers has been harassing folks, especially people from marginalized communities and nothing happens, no consequences. With, com with the compensation fund, it will hurt our town financially. It will, it will force our town to, to bring reform to APD, hopefully, is the hope. Because when something involves money, people will start you know, raising questions. This officers has been doing this for years and get away with it. And people keep hurting. It needs to stop. It put a stop to it. Um, you want to go next, um, yeah. Allegra? Yeah. Um, so we talked about who, what the purpose would be. And so it would be available to people impacted by police misconduct, such as brutality, harassment, or over surveillance. Um, and I think it's important to kind of conceptualize what healing means on an individual basis. So it, I, I think we talked about not having the funds be only for specified categories, but for, for things that could support somebody's healing, whether that's accessing mental health or social services, compensating for lost wages, or anything else that somebody who is impacted would need to, to move forward. 
Also, we um, some of the recommendation is that the money should come from the police department, but we all know that the union will not allow that to happen. But we also have potential sources of funding. Like we still have some money left over from APA funds. We can access uh, funds from um, cash reserve or even cannabis, uh, can cannabis sales tax revenue. And more than anything else, um, the families and youth want to ensure absolute confidentiality. And I agree with that, that neither our town department should handle the payments. Whatever is agreed upon between the town and, and, the, vic and the victim and the, the uh, MS9, we should, that should be an agency, preferable BIPOC-led organization to, to pay out the money without any, any strings attached to it. We don't want the town going to pay a therapist so that folks can get therapy services. No, you know, this is like settlement, okay? Give them the money to, you know, to use it to do whatever healing work individuals and individual families need to do. So we, it should not, you know, the, the, the disbursement of the funds should not come from any of the town departments. The town, we need to find a bipoc organization to handle that aspect. And I, I just want to thank um, Allegra because she, you actually drafted most of it. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Pat and Allegra. I could see perhaps, you know, um, not wanting to put more on the Human Rights Commission, but a Human Rights Commission type of uh, group um, uh, that having to convene when people apply. Is that something that uh, you imagined, both you and Allegra imagined that when people apply to that fund, you know, that would trigger a, a meeting of that group, a convening of that group to decide how the, the money is to be dispersed or is it an ongoing group or you haven't gone into the, those details? Uh, so, yet. so in my conversation with you know some of the uh, families, the thinking is that um, it will not be like an open meeting type of thing where where families and you you know or whoever resident and the town trying to negotiate settlement. Okay, once two parties agree on it, mm -hmm. there has to be independent bipoc led organization. Okay. to disperse the money. So with since um, resident oversight board, we don't have it. So that's what we're talking about gap, you know, that's no, so with, you know, thinking maybe human rights commission go handle the complaints. Mm -hmm. And then um, if that, if the resident, you know, affected decide to fight, you know, to access the fund, they should be able to do that. And it, it needs to be negotiated, I will imagine, with the town manager, whoever have the power to make you know, decisions with you know, money. Okay. But it's something that has to be done privately, uh, not discussed openly about how much people are getting. So the families want to make, you know, and the youth, it has to be a confidential amount. That's what you do you know, for comp you know, compensation, for settlement, that's what you do. Any questions or comments? So, yeah, so I was hoping, I'm sorry. I was hoping that I make a motion tonight, but I don't know if we have enough time for discussion, but I just don't want us to only present tonight and no action. And, and I know we met twice this month. I'm almost feeling, do we even want to meet twice next month? Because this month we met twice, and some of the stuff we hoped to accomplish didn't happen. We didn't hear back from the town council. We didn't. We haven't. We don't know what the final uh, investigation report is from the town. Uh, we don't know who is going to handle the voices of the families. Like I would like us to have like a concrete thing that we can 
either sent to the town manager or to the town council, either in the form of making a motion or just agreeing for our coaches to write letter that this is what we discussed today and whatever. Like I'm kind of like action oriented type of person. I, I don't like too much talking. Yeah, no, I, I agree, Miss Pat. I just wanted to make sure that no one had any questions about what you and Allegra presented before we move on. Sure. So that is so Miss Pat has, has put it into uh the into full view there. What do we want to do next? Well, well I have I, I have the yes. The I just have like one question around the victim compensation fund. Uh, or justice compensation yeah. fund. Uh, I know the, the name has been changed. So justice compensation fund is just in terms of, I think, you know, uh, and I agree, Ms. Pat, obviously we, we need to be action oriented and we need to kind of follow up with, with something, but obviously we're seeing that things are falling on, on their fear. So I don't know if we need to take it to media really at this point, you know what I'm saying? Uh, which would be more so what I would go towards is, yeah, we can send them an email or whatever, because we've already done that. And when we send the email to them, we send it also to all the media outlets so that they know what's going on. Because obviously without the media being involved, it seems like nothing's happening. Um, but in terms of the Justice Compensation Fund, I guess it's how we're gonna, because there's still a lot that needs to be kind of figured out about that. You know what I'm saying? There's still a lot of details. You know, I agree with it. And I think, you know, we need to establish it, but I think we need to put it in a way that gives still, like we were discussing when it was first initially kind of brought out, like, okay, who's the one that's going to kind of like make some of these decisions to kind of create it, right? So that the families of Amherst Nine and then future uh, families and, and, and people that are impacted by the police can obviously benefit from it, right? So I, so that's my only, my only thought is that there's still a lot to kind of be decided about that. So mm -hmm. when we do include it, let's put it in a way that kind of gives us or gives whomever the wherewithal to, to to um, fill in the details so that it's not on the town or the police or whatever to fill in those details. I mean, what we present, thank you. What we presented tonight is just a draft. And I know, you know, there are some more details we could add, but um, meanwhile, I worry that this youth and families are hurting. And there is no movement in our town to do anything. We need to raise hell as a, as a committee because that's what we're you know, selected to do, to do our job. And that's what we're doing. It may feel uncomfortable for some people, but history will judge. We need to do the right thing so that this youth will feel supported, basically. Yes, uh, there should be ongoing comp uh, justice compensation fund into future. But at this time, I think there is urgency to really help this youth and their families, okay? It's impacting their academics, it's impacting their emotional well-being. it's impacting all aspects of their lives, work, everything. So the sooner they get financial relief, the better. The next step would then be for the whole community to, have to start the healing process. So we need to keep up the pressure. Deb, I like your idea about the media because that does get our town attention. We need to keep the pressure. That's what CSWG did. We need to make changes in our town because the town council already committed of making our mess inclusive, right? This is what it takes to do it. So I'm going to agree with, with all of that um, and offer to help write a press release. Again, it comes down to do we as the co-chairs or whoever wants to help with that, take a stab at it and then we approve it. Next meeting, the process for the whole open meeting law um, issue is, is at hand, but I'm totally in agreement with that because this is the time going back to our first conversations within the agenda to not only um, challenge what is going on in terms of equity, right? And justice in this community, 
but our police are renegotiating, you know? So it calls into question, do we support this institution that has harmed and wronged our young people? I mean, it's like an abusive relationship. And I, I think of testimonials of young people who have been abused and who talk about the adults in their life who have failed them. I, I don't want us to be that committee that, you know, we could have acted or, or said a, a, made a stronger statement and we didn't do it. You know, I want these young people to feel loved, to feel healed, to feel that, yeah, I wasn't, I, I was vulnerable that time, but the community really wants to protect me and maybe I'll come back here and raise my children. Those statements that, the, the, that they presented, I can't see those young people coming back here and feeling safe enough to do that. And that really saddens me. So um, I'm, I'm with you, Deb, Ms. Pat. I don't know how the rest of the group thinks about that, but we, we write again to the town council. I have here in my notes um, asking to be on the agenda for the next town council meeting. Uh, also write to the chief of police, um, where's the police report? Um, and then uh, will the compensation fund letter, and I'm asking this as a committee, will that be um, the justice fund letter, will that go out separately? Or do we include that in a total press release in terms of this particular incident? We should include it. I would, we should, I would we should, include it. Yeah, we should include it. And, um, if I may, in terms of press release, I don't know how other people feel. Um, do we feel comfortable giving our two co-chairs to do the press release on our behalf or do people want to read it? Yeah, I think they should um, kind of draft it and then we could, you know, con you know, you can give it to Jennifer however we've done it and then we can the provide past. feedback and get it back. Just give us dead deadlines like we used to do with CSWG. Just say, okay, we would, we would need feedback by this day and whoever provides feedback does or whoever doesn't, then it, it moves forward. And so that just for clarification, then I'll go to you Freke. So the, the press release would be in the form or a, um, uh, a similar letter that we're going to also send to the town council and to the police chief. Is that and correct? we should send it to the town manager too. Manager, manager too. Town council. Well, yeah, we would CC all of them, but yeah, I just want then, to make sure that yeah. we, we have all that. Okay. Yeah. And all then right. and then we would just need to figure out so it would be a draft and then you know to, to give folks opportunity to give any feedback once the draft is made. But if we don't have to wait for the two weeks, we can just do it in the meantime. Okay. Do we know when the next town council meeting is? No, we need to look at that. Yeah. Is it next Monday or are they skipping a week? I have no idea. I, how, how is one week? Is one week too, too soon for people to send, you know, to give feedback and everything? Or? But we have to write it. Right. So they have yeah. to write it. So they have to write it first and then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I'm, I, I said at the top of this, I'm, I'm dealing with a, a child who's finally come down, unfortunately, with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but after Monday, probably Monday, I'll have time in which to commit some bandwidth to um, to work on a draft. Yeah. Then yeah, then give us a couple of days, whatever you whatever you think. Okay. But yeah, when is the next town council meeting? Do we know? Can we set deadline when we can send feedback to the coaches? And if people have uh, need to edit the. Uh, Justice Compensation Fund, that's fine too. Okay. Yeah. It's just that we might not know the deadline, Ms. Pat, until they put together the draft. So it would be more so if you want to say, okay, after they put out the draft, we have, I don't know, three, four days to give feedback. We could do that, I guess. The next town council meeting is October 3rd at 6.30. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, that's Monday. Yep. Oh, Monday. boy. So that's really soon. Very soon. And what, what's the one after that? Do you know what that, Phil? October 13th. Yeah. October 13th. So yep. maybe so we let's, let's, shoot for October yeah. 13th. Yeah. Can we shoot for that? 
Yeah. Miss Pat, what do y'all think? Huh? You wanted October 3rd. Can we yeah. shoot for October 13th? That would have to be the date. That's I mean, a Thursday. They meeting on a Thursday? Are they meeting on Thursday? I'm confused. Yeah, that's a Thursday. Okay. They are meeting. Yeah. It's a Thursday and on their agenda, it looks like a town service and outreach committee of town council, which okay. is public hearing on parking, public hearing on purpose. Okay. Like a public I mean, I guess yeah. I could get something together, but I don't know if y'all- 13 is fine, it. it's fine. Yeah. No, I think the 13th, we, we don't wanna fine. rush it that much, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, cricket. Cricket. Thanks everyone for this wonderful conversation. And I really appreciate the work that has been put in, um, starting with uh, Miss Young and with everyone else for the um, what we've been able to have with this meeting. I wanted to speak about the um, compensation fund. I um, don't think it's appropriate to have um, the name justice, um, a justice fund. Um, the question of justice has been one that for 2000 years, you've been trying to figure out the answer. Um, I think we could be much clearer if we have the name as something like police misconduct fund. It's very clear, precise, um, and it shows what we are aiming to push against that if we do believe we need this fund. So um, I, I'm not sure about um, having it as justice fund, but I also agree that um, something like a victim compensation fund that, that, that speaks, um, that's kind of weak um, name because it, it, it speaks to something that has been done to someone rather than what we're looking forward to, to do. That's, I think, the first plan I have. Um, something about justice is um, it implies due process. And one of the things that have been consistent about um, has been that we need to get a clearer sense of what's happened. That's what due process is. We might not know what um, happened entirely on that event, but I think there's more that we could know. And we're getting it from um, the statements that have been made by the families and by the youth. I want you to imagine a different scenario. And this is a scenario where you have um, a police officer or a pair of police officers confronting some youth. And the police officer claims that um, the youth might have maybe thrown a punch or abused this officer. Would it be um, okay if this police officer had a body cam and released just a minute. One of the things we would want to see is when did the recording start? How long was it? What I'm saying is there's more that we can know, there's more we should be pushing to know and I'm absolutely in favor of um, the push and the pressure that we want to bear on the council, the manager, the police. Um, but I think for the sake of due process, we do need to know more and we need to suspend judgment um, until, until then. It might turn out that everything that we feared and everything that we've believed, um, it might turn out that that's the case, but we won't know until we've reached um, that point. I do have um, a question, which would be my um, third point. Is this fund primarily for those who are um, BIPOC or is this yeah. a fund for anyone um, else? Now, if that's the case, then one of the recommendations, let me see where it's written, um, how to administer the fund. It says a third party, preferably a BIPOC led organization. Mm -hmm. um, should get this done. That's, I think, something that we can um, think about. Again, we're looking to have um, a community that comes together. Um, 
when we're dealing with something like misconduct, um, it might fall predominantly on one segment of the population than another, but the entire community gets affected. And that's something that I'd like us to um, think about. Thank you. Thank you, Freke. Uh, Deb? Um, yeah, I mean, Freke, I mean, obviously we understand that, that, you know, we have to kind of, how can I say it? You know, make sure that we're looking at all angles and look at all sides, you know, and of course, you know, thank you for, you know, sharing your, your viewpoint. Um, however, at this point where we're at is that we have, we have been engaging. We went and met with the town council at their meeting. Well, we, we started out by just sending a, a letter, you know, asking questions about that. Then we went to the town council. Then we've sent several emails to the town council and to others being like, okay, you know, and we haven't gotten like, even a response. Like we're busy. You know what I'm saying? Like we're busy. We can't get to you. Nothing. I mean, zero silence. So I, I'm all for due process. Obviously, I'm an attorney. You know what I'm saying? So due process is, is my game. You know what I'm saying? That's what I believe in. However, we've given a, a lot of opportunity for the town council and others to respond and nothing has happened. If we don't respond, this, this incident happened in July. And what we're asking for, we're not, we're not, I, I don't feel like I'm judging. What we're doing is saying, hey, you need to, this is about healing. People are hurting as we've just heard. So there needs to be something since you're not doing some, you're not, you're, you're not taking the steps. Then we want to take the steps to heal the community. I think this is what's going to help to heal the community, right? Is to heal. Where's your investigative report and put us on the town council meeting. So I don't think we've judged. We're actually just asking for action, right? We're asking for a report. We haven't even seen a report, a final report. We haven't even gotten the decency of a response from the town council for our emails. So for me, it's, it's about moving forward and giving voice to the voiceless, right? Which is our young people who are impacted by this and their families and parents and so on and so forth that are saying they, you know, they, they want some type of accountability because no accountability has been given to them whatsoever up to this point. We are in close to October, this happened in July. So I'll, I'll, I'll just end there, but look, that's my, my opinion. Thank you, Deb. Pat? So, um, so Frecky, um, we don't always agree and that's okay. <laughs> We're from the same country. <laughs> You're my brother or nephew, whatever. So I do agree with you that about your, your suggestion with police misconduct. I don't know about other members. I love it. I like police misconduct compensation fund. It's very direct. I like that. Thank you for suggesting that. I'm also a firm believer of due process, but what you have in our town is lack of transparency. If those kids, if one of the kids didn't videotape, we wouldn't even know anything. People will just believe what police said because they have the power, they have the clout, you know, people are afraid of them. Retaliation. For some of us who are speaking up, we're risking everything for what we're doing. It's not easy. You know, for, 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 for some of us who are speaking up. So they've had their chance. It's been, yesterday was actually 12 weeks that the incident happened. Please, is 12 weeks not enough? time for our town to take action and i'll just leave it there thank, thank you. you philip yeah so i have the unique like perspective of the human rights commission and everything else and i will say that this issue is very much i think as miss pat said fighting for it is very hard on our soul hard on our self. So transparency really <laughs> needs to happen. And like, I'm about that close to breaking on that of uh, transparency. So the Human Rights Commission filed the complaint. The Human Rights Commission is waiting for a response. Human Rights Commission didn't even hear anything back for a while. 
about that complaint. Like, was it received? Was it not? What's happening? I kept on pushing, kept on doing it. Now we have an incident to where we're waiting on a report and this report may be done. It may not be done. It's very unclear to me if it is done. I do know that at the very least, the detective involved has submitted something to the chief of police. Now there's an incident to where this may not even come out to the public for transparency because of uh, the collective bargaining agreement that the police commission has or the police have right now that we all just spoke to earlier. And that transparency piece is what's really igniting, I think, my flames, igniting some people that I talk to's flames. And it really is just kind of like, look, an incident happened. And saying nothing speaks volumes to what you actually think of the incident. Not doing anything speaks volumes to what you actually think of the incident. And so the presentation on posts, very much appreciated. I think that that covers a lot of why posts needs to happen like yesterday to <laughs> have all this just not be a thing because then we would have a police department that wouldn't be tied up in a collective bargaining agreement that if any disciplinary actions are done to these officers that it doesn't become public record for that reason. It's, it's ridiculous. That's it's crazy to me. Like what? The community is hurting, the community is asking for questions that we may not hear about anything. So that piece of it is very hardening on me. And I think that the letter that the family sent and the quotes that the um, victims of this incident sent spoke volumes to it. And I will just echo Ms. Pat's um, announcement earlier that if you have time to look at the Human Rights Commission video, I think that that was just kind of raw emotion reacting to the video, and I'll leave with what I left there. This becomes a defining moment in these young individuals' life. People of color, and all of us on color on this call, and in every community, can think of that defining moment in your life of kind of what sets you off to be like, oh, like, I don't know if I trust that person, or oh, that incident <laughs> happened, and that I don't really care for. So, for many young individuals that they that are involved in this incident, this is that defining moment. And to speak to everybody else on this call, what are we doing? What is this community doing to make that defining moment in these individuals' life make it feel, make them feel like we got their back? Like we we're gonna do something. We're going to, as Miss Patchell, we're gonna raise hell. <laughs> like I said, I'm that close to doing it. Thank you. With that. Thank you, Philip. Pam? Uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, uh, Councillor Dorothy Pam has her hand up, and so I'm going to move her into the uh, panelist, uh, allow her to talk. <clears throat> yes, Dorothy, hello. Hi, I just wanted to respond about the date of the town council meetings. It's Mondays, October 3rd, and Monday, October 17th. Ah. The October 13th meeting is a TSO meeting, but sometimes if a certain number of counselors are gonna to go to a meeting, Lynn declares it a town council meeting, even though it really isn't. Okay. So, cause we're not allowed to get together and talk unless it's a formal town council meeting. So it's the third and the 17th are what you want. Okay. Thank you. And <clears throat> enlightening discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks for that Thank clarification. You. So uh, we have two proposals for names of the compensation fund, one justice uh, fund and the other, what what did you say, uh, Fricke? Police? Misconduct. Police misconduct fund. I so, love it. I love it. so I think, you know, just to respond to it, I like uh, the, the justice fund because certainly it is empowering, but also if the if the fund doesn't have you know full specificity of being awarded just for police misconduct, let's say there's some act of bias that harms uh, someone and they are you know 
it, it, it could be uh, also traumatic in, in some way, but not involving the police. It could be, um, you know, some uh, uh, staff person or um, uh, some other incident within the community. I, I don't know, you know, but let's say it's not directly related to a police officer and that young person or you know individual needs some counseling in in some way so what happens is it, can they apply to the fund so i agree i think deb had mentioned well it needs to be fleshed out a bit more but if this is if we are saying it's specifically just for police related incidences, then, you know, I'm, I'm surprised, Reiki, it's so specific. But um, if that's the case, I think the specificity works. However, if it's something that could be used for other incidences of harm within this town, and the person applies for that money uh, to help with counseling or, or what have you, then uh, having that specific name might hinder, you know, uh, it, it being awarded or, or utilized in that way. Uh, Deb, I think. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, and I think like if we're that specific, we, we can run afoul um, with, with some of the stuff, even if we're just limiting it to, to police, which like I said, I mean, the, some of the details need to be ironed out, right? If are we saying it's a, um, a compensation fund for anything that the town does or before what we were talking about was the police specific more so to the police and what you know the actions that they took um which i think we probably want to stay in that realm i, I don't know if we want to broaden it but maybe we do i don't know so we'd have to have a discussion right so but even if it was within the realm of the police if we say set you know um police misconduct then we're going to run into as we know right words matter and so then they're going to say well this incident it was no misconduct you know it was just you know there was no violation there was just this and this and this and so and then what we're going to get into is that impact will not matter anymore it'll matter whether the, it was a violation under whatever law so so on and so forth right so i think for me we want i i wouldn't I wouldn't be for the, you know, saying police misconduct. I would say justice, or if you don't like justice, we can come up with another word, but something more broad, more general than, than that specific, because I know the player words and then what, what we will go down, the path that we will go down. Yeah, that. my <laughs> concern as well. Allegra? Um, so I guess I was just gonna say, I've been doing a little bit of research and what I have found is that victim like the actual like victim compensation funds across the country people who have had interactions with the police like people who have had a relative die at the hands of a police shooting are not eligible for those funds and part of it is because they have to have a police report stating something you know stating what had happened they they have to be cooperative with the police in the investigation and um they have to have not been you know found to have been doing anything wrong so i think i know california has been trying to get on the ballot to make um make victims of police brutality eligible for the already established victim compensation fund but i think that kind of in, in conceptualizing what this would look like. I don't think there needs to be all that red tape in terms of having a police report, having this, having that. Um, and I, I, I could see where maybe there is concern about the word misconduct, but I, you know, if the police are not the ones who are deciding who is eligible for this or not, then I would hope that at least a layer of that is taken away and that if it's if it's funneled through the ROB at some point in the game, that that would that body would be making decisions in in a manner consistent with some of the you know the spirit of CSWG and and the envisionment of that body. So 
Okay, so just so I'm understanding, because probably mm -hmm. everybody else understand, but I might not be. So you're saying that um, it shouldn't, the name police um, compensation fund should not be a part of it and it should have justice or what it, What are you saying specifically? I wasn't necessarily speaking to the name of the fund at all, just kind of speaking to the idea of, I guess I, you know, I think misconduct is kind of, for, to, to me, I think it's like a broad enough term because I think it could encompass over surveillance. It could encompass you know, brutality. It could encompass use of force. It could encompass um, unprofessional behavior as as we saw in the post guidelines. Right. So I don't necessarily think misconduct would be a word that wouldn't encompass the different areas that, that we're perhaps envisioning could make somebody eligible for this fund. Um, so you're in favor of police misconduct potentially. Uh, potentially <laughs> okay all right that's that's all i wanted to make sure i, I was understanding so, this so, so i may because i've also did some research i've been talking to the families impacted as well i think it's very straightforward and simple okay the focus here is the police this initial fund uh funds should focus on police misconduct and it's not up to the police to say they were wrong or not. No, we're taking away that power okay. from APD. We don't care whether they said misconduct happened. They already said it with this uh, MS9, that they didn't do anything wrong. It doesn't matter. What matters is the impacted resident, regardless of your race. This is for any resident, okay, that has suffered harm in the hands of police. It's not police to admit. We don't care wh whether police admits or not. Is the person who experienced it is what we're talking about here. So I will vote for police misconduct because it's very specific. And if in the future, CSS JC want to you know, recommend additional compensation fund, I'm off for it. My worry is if we make it too broad, this might drag on knowing that our town government doesn't really care that much about the lives of marginalized people. So the more narrow we do this, only for APD, put that attention to APD. This is what you'll be doing to our people for a long, long time. Now it's time for you to pay up. It doesn't matter whether you admit or not. ROB, or in the meanwhile, um, the Human Rights Commission get to decide, along with the person who experienced it, whether they, you need compensation or not, not the police. They don't have any say on that. No, this is not what this is for. I don't know if I'm making this you know, clear enough. No, I think it's it's clear and yeah. as, a, as a strategy as well. So I, I appreciate that explanation. Yes, Freke? Yeah, thanks for some of the clarifications that I've had. And to respond to Deborah, I think I, I like justice. Um, I think there's almost no one who dislikes justice, even those who are unjust. Um, and so what we're looking for is a very clarifying way to to speak to something specific um, and that's why i went for um the misconduct fund i think one of the pickups that we seem to be having rests on adjudication who gets to decide that's really one of the fundamental questions and i don't know what the answer is and that's something that i would like us to um think about going forward, who gets to decide what misconduct is. Apparently, we don't trust the police enough. And if that's the case, then we can't allow them adjudicate their own case. That's fine, but who gets um, to decide? Um, I'd like to return to the state, the Justice Compensation Fund's draft. Um, I think, 
somewhere here it mentions that anyone who has been negatively impacted by interaction with the police um, will be able to apply. Um, what does negatively impacted mean? You know, um, I think in the statement that was made by the families, um, one of the lines spoke about the fact that it wasn't um, brute violence that was um, unleashed on the kids, but what was unleashed was um, racism, I think. Um, if that's the case, again, what, what does negatively impacted? And that's why we do have to return to the question of adjudication because we can't allow it, or I believe that we shouldn't allow um, such a broad, um, loose term weaken whatever goals we're looking for with regard to healing within um, the community. Thank you. Just quickly a point of process here, because it's 847. I hear what you're saying, Frike, and I think those are elements, and it was mentioned earlier, to be decided later. Like those are, and, and you're bringing up really good questions, such as who gets to decide what does negatively impact mean? You know, maybe that um, takes us to refining the document at some point and, and uh, uh, further, you know, defining that. And then, uh, you know, talking about adjudication. But I think those are things we could take up at a later date. What I think this meeting can accomplish is um, we need a name for the fund because if we're going to include it as a part of um, a, a, a letter to the town council and as a press release, then those things have to be decided in order to write that up. Um, we can have a later discussion on how that uh, compensation fund um, uh, should be administered and what's the process and go through that. That's my suggestion because I don't think we have the bandwidth or the time to fully discuss that, but you bring up some really good questions. Deb? Yeah, I agree with that too. I mean, it's 848, you know, I need to get to, you know, my family. Uh, so I think we need to wrap this up and just get to a vote. Um, you know, again, let's put it to the vote in terms of the name. Like you said, the details, we'll figure it out afterwards and stuff like that. I still don't agree with, with, with I'm not gonna just put it out there. I'm not gonna vote for, for police misconduct because I already said what I had said about it because I think it, it'll get twisted down the road. But, you know, let's put it to a vote because majority is, 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 what, is, is what takes it. So let's do that because, you know, and because of time, we need to keep this moving along. <laughs> let's keep the train moving. Yes, absolutely. If I may, very quickly, I didn't respond to uh, Freke's question about why BIPOC-led organization. This came directly from some of the youth and, and families. If it's, if, if it's done by white-led organization, some BIPOC folks will not feel comfortable accessing the fund. So that's the reason why it was stated there by you know, BIPOC-led organization to administer the funds. I just wanted to mention. I, I appreciate that, Ms. Pat, and I'm all for centering um, uh, folks who are often at the margin. I mean, not always, but who are often at the margin, particularly in terms of um, the administration of such a fund that impacts uh, more, um, uh, more often certain communities, why shouldn't they be at the center? So um, I, I hear you. Freke? Um, I, I hope it's not that hard to find an organization that um, across the board, a lot of us could agree um, will be impartial. Well, I, I don't think you're, you're being uh, partial if you're a BIPOC person. <laughs> so that, that's also, uh, we don't have to get into it now, but I hear you. It's something that we have to, we have to further refine, but 
just because you're BIPOC, it's it's like just because you're Obama doesn't mean Obama was just the black people president. So I, I hear what you're saying. All right, so let's try to get something completed here tonight. And um, it sounds like uh, Allegra and I will be drafting uh, a letter to the town council um, following up on uh, the incident that occurred and uh, asking to have CSSJC be placed on the agenda for October 17th. And we will send it to the town manager, Chief Livingstone, because that uh, letter will also include uh, a demand for the police report, right? And then we are going to mention the compensation fund that uh, we have yet to decide on what's the name. So maybe we have to put that to a vote, but I just wanna make sure those are the, the three things to include. Is that correct, team? Yes. Okay, all right, good. So we, we will draft that. And um, I, I think Pam, we send it to, to you and to Jennifer and then Jennifer and you send it out to the committee. Is that how that process works? I just want yes. to- Yes. Yes, that's, that's correct. Jennifer's out of the office. So, um, well, I, hopefully she'll be back in before that you've completed your draft, but you send it to both of us and I'll make sure that it's out if she's not back in. Will do, okay. And then uh, we need to decide if, if we're all clear on that, then we need to decide on a name. Even if it's a working name, I always say, we might you know, decide a different name, but if, if the name for now is the, the Justice Compensation Fund or the, the Police um, uh, Misconduct Fund, then you know, we go with it and we can always um, decide, you know, maybe even once that committee convenes uh, that we're envisioning, decide on a different name. So we have to make a motion. Um, I could do that. So um, what about a name, and I'm gonna just complicate things even further. What about a name that includes healing? Healing and Restoration Fund. I, so long. I know Philip is like, <laughs> it is so long. <laughs> all right, then exit. See, that's what I'm saying. It's like we could we could have all kinds of names. So all right, so either justice or uh, police uh, misconduct fund. So who, Freke, you said you're going to make the motion. Yes. We have to do it. We have to do it in two parts because it's two different names, I believe, just to make it clear. Unless uh, can why don't you just do it? He can just do the the police misconduct one, mm -hmm. and then if, if everyone likes that, if it majority just we'll go with that. I, I think when, in the essence of time, let's let's keep it moving. All right. I think Freke right. is going to make that right. If there's a majority of us that wants to go with that, right. then we just go with it. All right, let's do it. Make motion. Okay. So I move that the um, justice compensation fund drafts. Um, be renamed the Police Misconduct Fund. No compensation? I'm confused. Oh, compensation, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, okay. uh, yes. Um, so restate, restate. Okay. Um, so I move that the Justice Compensation Fund um, be renamed the Police Misconduct Compensation Fund. Okay, is there a second? I second. Okay, all in favor of Freke's motion. We need to have a show of hands. Okay, so that's three. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all just keep things exciting. Okay. Um, it, it, I don't oh, know. Sure. We'd have to include Pam to uh, break the time. She can't. Yeah, she can't. Oh, no, I know. I'm just. <laughs> um, 
All right. What do we want to do, people? It failed because we didn't have majority. I know. It's, it's straightforward. So that, now you can put you can put justice forward, and then it'll be go. the same thing, though. It'll be yeah, that's right. And so, so we it, gotta come up with a different name then. Not justice, <laughs> so not you want to do the healing one? I kind of like something healing, but I still want the focus to be on the. What about program. healing compensation fund? I mean, you all thought the other one was too long. <laughs> Or restoration fund. Oh, that's too long. Healing. Hmm. Uh... Well, I think it's so aspirational to to heal. I'm I'm gonna take that one back. But yeah. um, um... <laughs> I'm getting all kinds of suggestions. Okay. Uh, yeah. What are some of the suggestions? What are the suggestions? Yeah, Miss Pat? Pat. What were the other suggestions? <laughs> We need help. Beloved community funds. That's also kind of aspirational. Cause yeah. are you left whole? Set settlement fund. I'm struggling with settlement. It sounds I, I too legal. I tell you what, I it's tell not, you what. It's too legal. Yeah, and after all those suggestions, I'm now leaning towards the police misconduct. <laughs> you know, Amos can start something new that other communities might, you know, pick up on. I like the focus police misconduct. We're taking away their power. It's not up to them to say that that is a misconduct. So right. what, what, but exactly. but the problem that I have with that, Ms. Pat, is that yeah. you're you're looking at it right now. We when we have a group of people that are going to be looking at that. What about ten years down the road, five years down the road, a new group comes in and then they define what police misconduct is. I try to look at you know down the road, like it's not just me, right? I'm not here anymore. People that I put in, it's not there anymore. What if they decide that police misconduct is a high bar? <laughs> And then these folks are not going to get any money because it's police misconduct. They set the definition. They set the standard. That's my concern. That. So I'm I'm getting text that says police will go against the police well, misconduct. The union might push back. We know that already. Oh, that's, that too. That's, that too. Yeah, that's for that's sure. That's my concern. That's my. So concern. I'm I'm changing my vote because yeah. I want these families to to get. I changed my vote. I'm sorry. Okay. We'll push back. <laughs> well, the first motion failed so quickly. Someone make a, a new motion new so motion. we can vote and move on. Okay. So I'll make a motion. Go that ahead. We name the compensation fund, the justice <laughs> compensation fund. I'll second it. Thank you. All in favor of the justice compensation fund. Okay, one, two, three, four. Allegra, no? That's it. I, it's full, I, it doesn't matter. I already voted, so. <laughs> it doesn't matter, the majority rule. So it is the Justice Compensation Fund. I'm having fun with this group because we're so <laughs> informal. That's how HRC is. That's how CDBG, when I attended their meeting, I like it. This there we Robert, go. Robert Rules. Uh -uh. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. right. Justice Compensation Fund it is. So we have um, anything that people had uh, just going through to, to end the meeting. Uh, anyone uh, didn't anticipate? Yes. So I want to announce that um, our wonderful MS Sunrise Youth Group, they are planning um, Know Your Rights training. And we also promise that there will be a second uh, public comment tonight before we close up. And there are still some audience Absolutely. in this meeting. So yes, I just wanted to make sure there weren't any other things or, or announcements like you just shared. Amher Sunrise is a youth group and this is a training, Know Your Rights training. Uh, so excited that the young people are bringing this to the community. October 9th. Um, October 9th at 3 o'clock, 3 to 5. 
and I, I've been part of the plan, you know, I've been receiving their emails. So I'm kind of like CSSJC uh, rep, if people don't mind, because we'll be talking about the Know Your Rights. So uh, we are co-sponsoring the event as well. Great. And so- The Human Rights Commission is also sponsoring. Oh, I'm sorry, I cut you off, Philip. So you said the Human Rights Commission is also sponsoring. So it's several- also yep, co-sponsoring, yep. Great. So if folks want to know more about it, they can uh, contact you all. Great. Yes. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Um, I just wanted to say that the budget hearing, the first budget hearing is scheduled for November 7th. Um, so I imagine that at our next meeting, I'd like to propose penning some sort of formal letter to the town manager and town council about what we would like to see in the budget, um, specifically for Crest and DEI, um, drawing most likely from CSWG and the, um, the recommended budget that they had put forward two years ago. Um, Absolutely. I also have one announcement. The CDBG um, um, request for proposal um, is on. Uh, it's something in our next meeting, we may want to discuss how we can try to see if our DEI department, we can support the DEI department to apply for grants. And I'm not remembering the, the deadline, but it's something that we should think about putting in our next agenda. Great. I believe the deadline is November 4th. And yeah. um, I Thank just you. want to point out that you do have uh, one person in the attendees um, with a hand raise for this last public comment. Yes, yes. Thank you. OK, Thank you. I think we are ready to move on to um, public comments. Um, you're, yeah. Thank you. Vera? Hi, this is Vera Duong Mini Cage, 12 Longmeadow Drive in Amherst. Um, I want to thank each member of the committee and um, DEI officer Pamela Young for staying so long um, at this extended meeting once again. Um, I appreciate the need for um, a more robust DEI department. Um, and I want to raise that when I was serving on the Amherst School Committee, we wanted to um, establish um, PAR, the Participatory Action Research Project involving youth and families. Um, unfortunately, that never got funded from the school level. And I hope the town will take this seriously to um, consider that methodology to engage community. And um, I think we've heard a lot from white people in this town and we need to be intentional about reaching BIPOC communities. Um, I am um, aware that the CREST program um, has launched, um, but it is missing the voice of Asian Americans um, in that um, body. And I want to see the town um, be able to um, acknowledge that and seek ways to um, rectify that. Um, additionally, I applaud the, this committee for spearheading something that is an alternative to the criminal justice system, to the legal system. Um, we know that um, that process can be re-traumatizing for individuals and very threatening for families and that's why some people do not resort to um, seeking that type of resolution. Um, and so this type of um, justice fund or whatever name you decide um, is insignificant, but what is important is what it means to um, the children and families involved to be able to put this behind them um, in a way that this is not a topic of conversation um, that involves them directly, but they can be part of saying that this may have happened to me and my friends, but I did everything I could to stop it from happening to my younger siblings. 
and to the other generations that follow me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vera. Thank you, Vera. I just want to, um, since we mentioned the budget real quick, um, I'd like to know where we are in terms of translations of town council meetings um, and Zoom translation ability um, for uh, folks that speak languages other than English. So um, I, I think that's part of the work that we're committed to and in inclusion. So I just want to be want to be mindful and remind ourselves that there's still a need for that and uh, funding should should go towards that. Thank you all. Um, uh, we have to did we set the next meeting? We did not yet. Okay, this is still a good time for everyone these Wednesday nights. Okay. So we it is for me as long as uh, we don't go on the third Wednesday because that is when the human rights commission. Oh right, right. That's I remember that. So the next we meeting. Uh, are we going to try to meet twice in October? There isn't been if the town council invites us. Mm -hmm. That okay. I think it would be way too many meetings for us in October. Good point. Yeah. So the 17th, right, is that meeting. So we should meet uh, after the 17th or before? That's, I guess, the critical question. So the Wednesday before is the 12th. And then the Wednesday afterwards is the 19th or the, the 26th. The I'm sorry, say oh, that again. Six. The 26th. No. Yes, so the one immediately following the 17th is the 19th and then the 26th is um, the at the end of the month. So do we want to, to put it to the 26th? I'm, um, can I make fine. a motion that we meet on the 12th and then on that meeting then we decide kind of what's the next step because if we gonna meet on the 17th, we will know that by hopefully the 12th. And then if not, then we can just move the meeting to the 26th because the 19th is the third Wednesday. Okay. Yeah, because Phil can't meet on the third Wednesday. So that's why I was saying the 26th. Yeah, I think we should we should try to meet on the 12th just because too, so we can prep for the 17th. Let's say if they do give us the 17th, yeah. then we can like prepare for it too. Okay, let's, let's do that then. So we're doing uh, 12th? What are we doing? Yes. That's the 12th and it's the Wednesday in October. Okay. So put that on calendar still at six o'clock. And I think that's a good suggestion so we can uh, prepare. Hopefully if they put us on the agenda. Yes, well, we'll, we'll find out, okay? Well, well, we'll find out and that's where media comes in. So we'll, we'll find out before then when we yeah. have a meeting, we should be inviting the media. Right. You know, so, yeah. So the other the other thing is uh, Allegra and I will write the um, the press release. We'll have our names as the contact um, for that press release. So, you know, just in case, uh, I don't know, Scott Smersbach or whoever. <laughs> <laughs> will will contact us potentially. Do you have your hand up, Allegra? Are you? Are you no, <laughs> I just my all of a sudden the volume got really loud. Okay, so I but I mean, right. but I I'm but I bit. think even though you all will have your contacts, shouldn't they come from all of us though? On the on, on oh, the absolutely. But usually on a, I'm just thinking. You know, I, yeah. I, I no, 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 no. That's perfect. Right. I just yeah. wanted to to make sure that all our names will be on. It that. will be everybody's name will be on it as the committee, most certainly. Okay, anything else? And if we forget something in the draft, please, you know, feel free to send comments. So they would send comments, Pam, to, um, to Jen and to you, mm -hmm. and then it would circle back to us. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, all right, mm -hmm. great. Yeah, that's how you're doing. All right, thank you all for so, serving. So, 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 so. No? Well, we plan the next agenda items, if we can have the DEI and Chris um, update at first, like we didn't do it last time, we didn't do it today. Yeah. If we can 
put that as the first thing that, you know, because I'm, I want to hear more about the Crest program. I think I read somewhere about the Crest responders, you know, in the school, CSWG never, 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 never recommended that. It said, no, 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 no. But anyway, it's for next meeting. Okay. So if we could have that, Pam, already on the agenda, I'm sure we'll we'll be we'll remind you. But yeah, the the updates of that, um, and a, that's helpful. Okay, thank you, everyone. See you next time. Take care. Yeah. Good, Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.